A long time ago, during the pre-internet era, I worked in a local pizza place. I was only 17 at the time. It was a nice operation. The staff and management got along well. Try saying that with a straight face nowadays. One of our servers was a lovely young woman, we'll call her Brittany, who was very much a free spirit. She didn't own a car and would walk to work and would get rides home from other co-workers after her shift ended. She usually worked the late shift and closed up at around 10, usually leaving at about 11 after cleanup. I often gave her a ride home on the nights I didn't bike to work. She would sometimes even hitchhike home if no one could drive her. She was pretty fearless, but always kept pepper spray and a small knife in her purse, just in case. On one busy Friday night, we finished the post-shift cleanup at around midnight. We were the only two left at the very end aside from the owner, who was in the office counting the cash drawers and cataloging the sales receipts. Remember, this was before computers, so this had to be done with an adding machine and pencils. I rode my bicycle that day, as it was really nice outside for the first time in weeks. The owner said that she would give Brittany a ride if she waited until the accounting was done. It would be about another hour or so. She decided not to wait and said that she would just hitch a ride home. We both tried to discourage her from doing that, and I told her that she might not even get a lift in an hour anyways. But she just laughed and said, Hey, I'm a nice looking girl with great legs. Somebody's going to stop, and I have myself a defense kit. Honestly, I don't think her penknife would have even cut an apple, but it was something, and the pepper spray she used would at least be effective. I walked her outside, and we talked for a while in the parking lot. She joked about sitting on the handlebars of my bike and saying that I could bike her home. Of course, that wasn't an option. So we both laughed. I offered to stay with her until she got a ride. But she said no thanks, and that no one would stop if they saw her with a guy on a bicycle, and that it would have made them suspicious that we were up to something. So we said our goodbyes and headed off in separate directions. She didn't report to work on her next scheduled day, which was the following Monday. This was highly unusual. She was never late for work, or missed a shift without calling. A couple of days later, her mom came in, frantically asking if her daughter had been to work. She hadn't come home or called since Friday night. If she was coming home late or staying at some place, she would always call her mother. We were all freaked out a little bit. Her mother eventually reported her missing, and the police came around and questioned both me and the owner about that Friday night. The owner being a middle-aged woman and me being a goofy 17-year-old kid didn't interest them much as potential suspects or even persons of interest. After the police left, the teasing started. Restaurant workers can be a hard bunch, especially the kitchen staff, and most have a very dark sense of humor, at least the ones that I worked with. This went on for the next few shifts, and things didn't help when it became evident that I was the last person to ever see her alive. The cops came back into the pizza place and questioned me again, and also my parents, which of course freaked them out. Finally, about a week after she went missing, a co-worker was really giving me hell about it, telling the waitresses not to get too close to me or they might disappear. I finally had enough of his underhanded remarks. After he sarcastically asked me where I hid the body, I snapped back. At the bottom of the thing lake, you want to join her? Of course, everyone who overheard this went, ooh, and agged us both on. Being 17 and stupid, I said. Yeah, I put her on the handlebars, rode out to the dam, and threw her off. Now shut up and leave me alone. That quieted everyone down. He ended up calling me a few names, and we eventually returned to our duties. Well, 
Brittany's body turned up in the reservoir. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. There was a reason her body wasn't discovered sooner, but I can no longer recall why. Needless to say, the cops got a whole lot more interested in me now, after that sarcastic tirade at the restaurant, where I unknowingly foretold almost the exact way her body was discovered. They had my parents bring me into the station, and I was questioned again, without an attorney present. Back then, unless an arrest was imminent, a juvenile could be questioned without one as long as a parent was there. As the dam was a good 20 mile drive from the restaurant, I was eliminated as a suspect. They made an arrest a short time after that. It was a man they had suspected in a similar incident the previous year. He confessed to both murders in exchange for a life sentence. Obviously, there was no connection between me and him, but I still felt awful. When I went to Brittany's memorial, I just sat in the back quietly. By that point, word had gotten around about my morbid joke that turned out to be true. I didn't attend the burial service. I didn't want to upset her family. A few years later, I got work at a gas station and had the misfortune of selling an arsonist the fuel he used to set his own house on fire. But that's a story for another time. For context, this took place almost two years ago. I was 26 at the time. I was in Washington on sort of a vacation visiting my then fiance. We'll call her Sarah for the sake of this story. It was for a graduation she was having for basic training. It was a big deal for her family, and she asked me to be there for it. So I said why not, and booked a flight. I would be arriving a week before the rest of her family, so her and I could have some time together, just the two of us, before she would be busy having all of her family there for the occasion. She stayed with me at my hotel during this time, and eventually we decided that we wanted to get out and explore some of the nearby historical sites that Washington has to offer. I had never been there, of course, so the idea piqued my interest. Once we arrived at our location, we spent about four hours walking around, and seeing all the sites, from the Lincoln Memorial, to the Washington Monument, the Congress Building, and even the White House. It was a very fun and exciting experience for myself to see all of these places, as I had missed out going on a school trip in high school to visit them. Sarah at the time seemed to appreciate my interest in them, and we basically enjoyed ourselves. After we finally decided that we had had enough of walking around, and were ready to go back to the hotel, we used the Uber app to call for a ride. We had used it before to arrive and had no issues, so we decided just to use it again for the ride back. Sarah made the request on her phone while I sat down under some shade and waited. I was pretty tired from all the walking we had done, and I could feel that I was ready to get back to the hotel for a nice long nap. Eventually, after about 10 minutes of waiting, a car pulled up in front of us. Sarah mentioned to me that this must be our Uber, as the place that they had stopped at was not a parking spot. I stood up and followed her to the car, where she opened the back door and stepped inside, asking the driver, Hey, you're the Uber, right? He gave a slight nod to her without saying anything, and I then followed her into the car, shutting the door behind me. Now looking back on this, I realize how dumb we were. We should have been asking for the driver's name and verified it on the app. I didn't have access to any of this myself, as Sarah was the one who had made the request on her phone, so none of these concerns occurred to me at the time. As we both sat in the back seat of the car, which was a gray-colored van, the driver didn't say a word. I found this a bit odd as any other Uber driver we had had would at least greet me once and confirm my name and the address I was supposed to be driven to. But this guy? Nothing. The vehicle began moving without the driver acknowledging either of us. 
other than that brief nod he had given to Sarah. I did pick up on how weird it was, but I was tired, and I didn't really feel like trying to engage the man myself. I laid my head back and just closed my eyes. I then felt a tap on my arm from Sarah, after what felt like only five minutes into the ride. I opened my eyes and looked at her. She didn't speak to me. I could see the look on her face was one of worry, and it had me wondering what exactly she was concerned about. He then pointed to her phone, which was showing the route the Uber would take to drive us back to our hotel. It didn't take me long to realize that we were heading in the opposite direction. I could see the color in Sarah's face drain. Shortly after, a notification popped up on her phone, saying that our Uber had arrived, followed by a message from the driver asking where we were. The picture that popped up on Sarah's phone did not match the driver of the van. My heart sank into the pit of my stomach. I then knew that we had gotten ourselves into a situation I never thought that we would be in. I slowly looked back towards the driver, but I didn't say anything. I didn't know what this man's intentions were, or what he was capable of, and I honestly did not want to find out. I just knew at that moment that I had to get us both out of this van. I leaned forward and told the man that we had changed our minds, and would be fine with being let out where we were. This was an attempt to get us out of the situation without alarming the man that we knew. He glanced at me through the rearview mirror, and the first actual acknowledgement of me since we had gotten into the vehicle. I caught his glance as he stared at me without saying a single word in what felt like minutes, but was probably only about ten seconds. He didn't stop the van, and he didn't say anything in response to me, and just kept driving as if nothing had been said. My patience had run out, and I knew that whatever this man had in store for us wasn't good. I then did the only thing I could think of in that moment and reached into my pocket, pulling out my pocket knife I always carried on me. I flipped out the blade, and without wasting another second, I told the driver, We know that you're not the Uber. I don't know what your plan is here, but I have a knife, and if you don't pull over right now, I'm going to stick it right in your temple. The driver's eyes quickly looked at me again in the rearview mirror, and I knew he could see me gripping the knife in my hand. He then quickly pulled the van over, and I heard the doors unlock. Sarah and I wasted no time getting out as fast as we could. The moment we were both outside, the man sped off. We quickly took a moment to gather ourselves as Sarah was having a panic attack, and I was still trying to wrap my mind around what the hell just happened. Sarah quickly pulled out her phone and responded to our actual Uber driver, and informed him of our location, and asked if he wouldn't mind picking us up. The Uber driver arrived a few minutes later, and this time, we made sure it was the right one. We told him everything that had happened, he then informed us of something that made the blood in my veins turn to ice. He told us that there had recently been multiple instances where people were posing as Uber drivers in that area, as it was easy to find many tourists around there who wouldn't think twice about getting into a car thinking that it was an Uber or a Lyft. The guy told us that we were very lucky to have gotten out of that. We made it back to the hotel without issue and quickly reported this incident to the local police. We gave the description of the unknown driver and the van he was driving. The police told us that they would call us with any further information, but we never heard back from them, so I'm assuming the man was never caught or found. That worries me because he could still be out there, doing this to somebody else. Again, I realized how stupid we both had been, and how we didn't verify the vehicle before getting into it. But let this be a reminder to everyone listening to do just that, and always make sure you're aware of your surroundings.
This story happened in September of 2007. I live in Lyon, France. I was 18 years old when this happened. I was taking a train back to my hometown from the south of France. I had visited my grandparents in the countryside before beginning my first year at university. I left on a Sunday at around 7 p.m. and I got on the inner city train. Here's a detail that will be important later on. The train was one of those old slam door trains. This means it was possible to open the door while the train was still moving, no matter how fast it was going. It also seemed like this train didn't have any cameras. Once I got on the train, it was mostly empty. As expected, it didn't have any air conditioning, but I couldn't afford the high-speed train tickets, so I would have to endure. About 30 minutes into the trip, the train made its first stop. Three shady-looking men boarded the train, and I was instantly creeped out. The three of them looked like they had just escaped a mineshaft explosion, and they were staring at me like I was a sirloin steak, the kind that costs more than $100. I decided to go into the next car and use the bathroom, but right after getting out of the bathroom, the three men surrounded me. They all had knives. One of them then yelled at me, Give us all your money or we're throwing your ass off the train. I froze in fear, and out of nowhere, one of them struck me in the back of the head, and then they dragged me to the door of the train. One of them opened the door and tried to kick me out while the train was still moving at high speed. Half of my body was out of the train, and I was trying hard to fight them off and prevent them from pushing me onto the gravel. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I thought I was going to die. Suddenly the train began to slow down. All three of them forced me off the train, and I landed onto some grass next to the tracks. I got up and started running. Once my adrenaline died down, I was processing what just happened. There was definitely something wrong with my leg, something I hadn't felt until that moment. It turns out it was fractured during the fall. A bystander happened to see me being thrown out of the train and called an ambulance for me. And before I knew it, I was in a hospital bed. The police later caught these three crazy men and they were sentenced to three years in prison, along with a huge fine. Yeah, I know. Three years in prison for attempted murder. And this is France. This is just how things go here. But at the end of the day, I'm just glad to be alive. Long time listener, first time submitter. I thought I would pick a story from my past. For some reason, it has made a resurgence and has almost become an unwelcomed guest in my mind. Perhaps sharing it will help me get over it once and for all. The year was 1986. I was 16 at the time. I was in Indianapolis at Union Station. It was around Christmas time or just after. I was with my mom, my two-year-old sister, and my 21-year-old uncle. At this time, my uncle still lived in Indianapolis, while the rest of us lived in southwest Indiana. We were getting ready to leave and drive back home. It was very cold out that day, and I was bundled up in my jacket, scarf, and gloves. My mom, God rest her soul, could talk a dead man back to life. So I was just waiting for her long-winded wrap-up. It was getting hot standing inside Union Station while wearing all that clothing. So I told her, It's getting too hot in here. I'm going to step out for a minute. My mom nodded, and I went out. There was no snow or wind, just perfect for me to cool down for a bit. Not even a minute or so of standing outside, right by the double doors, a white Chevrolet pulls up. Two big men with crew cuts were sitting in the driver and passenger seats. They were at least 6'5", and probably about 280 pounds each. I figured they were probably from our local military base, but that was just an assumption. Immediately after seeing me, they stop at the curb, roll down the window, 
and smile. Hey, come here. I want to talk to you. The passenger said, Bear in mind that I'm 16. If this were to happen to me today, things would be much different. But as a kid, I was very polite, almost to the point of being docile. I was always very apologetic when I thought I'd screwed up in some way. I look up and I saw a streetlight above me. I looked back at them and started apologetically stating, Oh, I'm sorry. This is not what it looks like. At that moment, it was more amusing to me. I hadn't really considered that I was in some kind of danger. They kept reiterating that they just wanted to talk to me, and I kept explaining to them that I'm not a street girl, and this is not what it looked like, and that I was sorry for giving the wrong impression. It didn't occur to me that they weren't listening to a word that I was saying. All of a sudden, the passenger gets out and starts moving toward me like a hungry dog staring at a T-bone steak. A switch went off in my head, and I was no longer apologetic or embarrassed. I was just pissed, and I yelled, You don't have to get out of your car if you just want to talk to me. I can hear you just fine from here. I suddenly found the 70% Irish and Scandinavian heritage on my dad's side, and it came out in full force. I was proud of myself for having shown some backbone, but there was still a towering, hulking man coming right towards me. I bolted back inside, where my mom was still yammering. Upon seeing me, my mom and uncle were immediately alarmed. They hadn't seen the man get out of his car, but they could tell that I was frightened. I told them what happened, and my uncle asked, What were they driving? A white Chevrolet. My mom then cut in. Go get him! My uncle bolted out of the door and down the street, chasing after the Chevrolet. Get the hell out of the car so I can bust out your teeth! My mom was livid, but I could tell that my baby sister was getting upset, so I tried talking her down. My uncle came back in a few minutes later, winded and worn out. When he caught his breath, he said, oh, I almost caught up with him when they got to that traffic light at the end of the block but they peeled out right before I got there. Welp, that put a major damper on our trip to Indianapolis. The moral of the story is, ladies and gents, don't allow your good manners to supersede your own safety. Who wants to die being polite? My name is Lisa, and I've been a content creator for about four years now. I'm not a huge influencer, but I've partnered with several brands and collaborated with many other creators. I won't name my account or anything, I mean, I'm not getting paid for advertisement. In my time of being a creator, it's been a fulfilling journey, but like everything, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. For context, this happened about three years ago, back when TikTok was at its peak. With everyone being inside from the pandemic, many people turned to social media for entertainment. This of course caused me to get in front of the camera and create videos which built me a decent audience back then. Now the content I mainly did involved me dancing to popular songs as that was a big trend. This made for many people, especially men, to take notice of this. Men seeing a woman in her mid to late 20s dancing was basically a goldmine to them. I got a ton of weird and creepy comments from this, but I knew that was expected. While I found some of them creepy, there was one comment that I had seen that nearly sent a chill down my spine. I had just recently posted a video where someone by the username of James210 said, You're looking damn good today, Lisa. Now, you might be thinking that it was just another creepy comment, but the thing was was that I never displayed my real name. My page only displays my last name, so there was no way someone could have found out my first name. Mind you, I keep my first name a secret, and I don't even talk in my videos. 
Assuming it was maybe a friend or family member playing some sick joke, I just deleted it and tried to forget about it. As time progressed, however, the more James continued with his comments and even tried DMing me. His comments ranged anywhere from innocent compliments to straight up derogatory. I only ever remember responding to his DM telling me to leave me alone and to stop trying to contact me. This seemed to have worked for quite some time, and I actually ended up forgetting about the whole thing. One day, I was in my room filming a TikTok as usual, when I hear my front door being closed. I live in an apartment with my boyfriend, so I assumed he had gotten back from work. He must have been home early, I thought, and I happily called out to him. I'm in here, honey. However, I was met with silence and sort of began to feel that sense of dread. It was kind of like that feeling you'd get when you know something's wrong but aren't sure what it is. I then hear footsteps slowly approach my bedroom where I was met with a man who I could only describe as James. He was middle aged with brown hair and I could already smell the alcohol off him. He wore jeans with a bulky jacket and on his side sticking out of his pocket was a gun. It only took me a good second to recognize him from his profile picture and that's when I screamed at the top of my lungs. Then he began to act innocent, saying that he must have had the wrong floor or something. I abruptly scoffed at him, declared that I was not stupid, and told him to get the hell out. At this point, my fear turned to anger, and after constantly screaming at him, he finally got the hint and left. Thankfully, my boyfriend had got home soon after, and had stayed with me until I calmed down. My boyfriend was on the phone with the police for a few minutes trying to give the operator our room number and building. The police eventually found our apartment, but not before arriving after 20 straight minutes. I know time seems to go slow during scary situations like this, but the amount of time it took for police to arrive still blows my mind. The account was taken down not too long after he left, so I couldn't provide them with any information other than a description. The police said they'd take a look into it, but that there was no guarantees they would find this James person. That was confirmed, as I never heard back from the police department, meaning that James is still out there. I'm not sure if he realized that what he was doing was wrong, or if he's still harassing people. I have no idea how the hell he found out where I lived, and quite frankly, I don't want to know. If I hadn't stood up for myself in front of James, I'm not sure what he would have done had I let fear get to me. The fact that he had a gun just proves his intentions were certainly not good. My boyfriend and I moved over two states away after this, and now live much more happier lives. The only thing that worries me is having to see any more of those comments, wondering if it's secretly James. I hope I never see him again. I'm 17 years old and I recently downloaded TikTok, the app that is taking over the world right now. I mainly got it just because my friends had it, but I didn't really see it as something I'd use much. Now before I continue, I want to mention about a boy in my class who clearly has feelings for me. His name was Kyle and was around the same age as me. This will be important in the story later. While I was flattered by this, I never felt the same way and because of this, his behavior began to change. Every time he'd ask me to go out with him, I'd always say no or ignore him. He got really upset whenever I rejected him and sort of made me feel bad when I did, telling me that I was breaking his heart and that he was going to hurt himself if I didn't go out with him. I want to point out that he has autism and he would use that as an excuse for me rejecting him. While I'm not prejudiced by any means, I just didn't feel the same way. 
His behavior continued for about a month with me trying to avoid him at all costs. Fast forward about two weeks later, it seemed he had stopped with his obsession with me, which was relieving to say the least. One day, I had been scrolling through TikTok when I came across a video from Kyle. I had Kyle's number, and TikTok would sometimes show you videos posted by your contacts. I can't remember what the video was about, but for whatever reason, I decided to check out his account. I look at his page, and that's when I notice one of his videos had something that appeared awfully familiar. Upon tapping on the video, I felt my heart sink when I realized that he was in front of my house in the video. He went on to explain to everyone that he was at his, quote, girlfriend's house and how easy it was to find it. I kid you not, I almost pissed myself when I saw this. This whole time he knew where I lived and I didn't even know. I thought about telling my parents about it, but I'm not sure what would have happened if I did. A week later, he was actually expelled from school for doing something else that I won't go into. This caused him and his family to move and I never saw Kyle again. This just goes to show you that social media can be a very dangerous place and that it could end up being a true nightmare if not used responsibly. And for the love of God, please use my story as a reminder that you could be watched anywhere without knowing. So, something weird has been happening lately. For starters, I want to say that I'm an atheist and don't believe in any god, the devil, or any spirits. After this incident, however, I'm not sure what to believe. My girlfriend died on the 7th of August of 2021. Her name was Kayla, and she was an amazing woman. Her death was caused by a drunk driver on the freeway while on her way home from work. Life kind of went downhill for me after she died. I didn't talk to anyone and sort of became withdrawn from society. I spent less time around friends and family, calling off work, and turned to the internet for attention. I mostly spent most of my time on TikTok, as this was around the time everyone had been hyping it up. I spent time on other platforms, but TikTok was the main one. I didn't post on it, I just sort of used it to watch videos and stuff to see all of the popular trends and news. One day, after a long and boring time at work, I had opened up TikTok and saw that I had a direct message from someone. Now rarely do I ever get any message requests, and when I do, it's usually from a friend. I open it, and to my shock, I see it's from Kayla's account. I guess her family must have forgotten to deactivate her account and assume that it had to be her younger brother on it. This was strangely weird, as I barely know her brother, and he's like nine, so I was rightfully confused. The message was a single hello, and out of curiosity, I type back, asking if it's her brother. However, instead of getting an actual answer, I just get bombarded with two more hellos and a how are you. Jaden, it's not nice to be on Kayla's account texting me, I said. All of a sudden, two completely out of random texts pops up. Avocado toast? Yo, I don't know, ask Nathan. To put it into context, the avocado toast comment was something we always enjoyed eating on Saturdays. And Yo Ask Nathan was an inside joke I don't feel like explaining. At this point, I come to the realization that there was a hacker on Kayla's TikTok account and was recycling old messages from previous conversations. There was even stuff her and I had discussed in person and not over the phone. I assumed whoever this person was knew Kayla really well and was playing some sick joke in the worst way possible. Now, you might be wondering why I didn't just delete my TikTok. I wish I had, and I did for a little while, but when I came back, the text started to appear again. 
Hello happened a million times, and whenever I responded angrily or upset, her hacker would just spit out nonsense. Then one day, I had sent what I assumed was Kayla's hacker a message, asking them why they were doing this and why they seek pleasure in messing with people. Two weeks later, I get a response, but it's the same recycled messages from previous chats. I remember about 20 plus, but the ones that really stood out to me were how we were going to get married and if I still wanted kids. For whatever reason, those were the two that really broke me as we were actually planning on getting married and having kids. After months of this happening, I really started to miss her and began messaging her not caring who was on the other side. The thought of talking to her in some way really brought me joy. One day, her TikTok account had suddenly been deleted for unknown reasons. I'm not sure if it was banned because of a hacker or if it really was Kayla. This devastated me for a good while and I even thought of myself going mental because of it. I ended up going to a psychologist who had to explain that it was all in my head and that my girlfriend really was gone. I know it sounds crazy but I have no explanation for what took place. If it really was her sending me those messages somehow, I'm entirely grateful for being able to talk with her once more. I miss you, Kayla. It's a scorching hot summer's day in Tampa, Florida. A high-definition camera records a spray of blood on the side of a car, slowly panning out to reveal the full extent of the gory scene. The car's door sports a small bullet hole, while the front seat's steering wheel and two plastic bottles are splattered in even more blood, this time a yellowy-orange color almost resembling bile. A man in a hazardous materials suit is then seen analyzing a spent bullet casing, recognizing it as a 9mm. It slowly becomes apparent that the video shows the aftermath of a drive-by shooting, one of many that take place in the United States every single day. And after being posted on the usually music-based video app TikTok, the video gained more than 6 million views, and it's not the only morbid medley that garnered such attention. This isn't TikTok anymore. Welcome to Murder Talk. Crime scene TikTok... Crime Scene Cleanup TikTok or simply Murder Talk are the nicknames for a collection of videos with over 200 million views that document real-life crime scenes in graphic detail. The videos are mostly filmed at homicide scenes and depict cleaning teams scraping, steaming, and mopping away blood and other gory fluids. Some of the so-called Murder Talk accounts also showcase the house of hoarders, Residences complete with overflowing fridges stuffed with rotting food, as rats and cockroaches and maggots scurry and squirm among the filth. It's a disgustingly disturbing delight for those fascinated with the darker sides of life. Washington-based Harley is 26 years old and grew up watching true crime and hoarder-based reality shows on TV with her mom, but she's now moved on to TikTok preferring the raw, unfiltered reality that crime scene cleanup videos have to offer. Harley says that while many of the true crime shows were extremely graphic, there was still a lot that wasn't shown. Her morbid curiosity regarding what occurs after death had her to looking up online photos taken from famous crime scenes and admits to exposing herself to sensitive content at a very young age. She's thankful that the TikTok content she watches now isn't overly fake or sensationalized, and says it's nice to just watch the cleanup happen without a ton of TV edited drama. Dana, a 17 year old from Ohio, also made a recent transition to TikTok after following a crime scene cleanup account on Instagram for a couple of years. For her, the draw of the content is a mixture of fascination with the macabre and a genuine desire to learn about the practicalities of the crime scene cleanup profession. It's something I'm drawn to because of the morbidity of it, I guess, she confessed. I've always been really obsessed with the death and understanding what happens to us physically when we do pass, so it's interesting to see just what kind of mess gets left behind when people die traumatically. Yet despite Dana's clarity that crime scene cleanup 
wouldn't be the best paid career. She also refuses to write off working in the industry in the future, saying that it's a job she'd often seriously consider for herself. One of the more popular accounts of the murder talk scene is at Crime Scene Cleaning. The account has more than 19 million views and 2.8 million followers, and it is they who created the drive-by video we previously touched on. Their signature has been to create a kind of crime scene cinematic universe with their videos starring kooky characters like Decomp Kyle and hoarding technician Fiona, whose speciality is inspecting overstuffed fridges. The At Crime Scene Cleaning account is run by a company named Spalding Decon, a trauma, biohazard, and crime scene cleaning company with a reach in reality that parallels their online success. With merchandise, online training courses, and a chain of cleanup franchises that stretches the length of the United States, it seems TikTok is just another arm of its sprawling business empire. A Nashville-based spokesperson claims that the company started using TikTok to better engage in what they referred to as the culture. While YouTube's video and Instagram posts are still extremely engaging and important, TikTok was another avenue where they could get their message and purpose out to as wide an audience as possible. Many new business opportunities have come through TikTok with the majority of inquiries coming in the form of younger people insisting that a parent or friend is in need of Spalding Decon services. As well as attracting new business, Spalding Decon has attempted to emphasize the educational aspects of their posts, whether that's about the cleanup industry itself or specific conditions like hoarding. Not only that, but the company's CEO, Laura Spalding, also demonstrates this on TikTok by hosting regular Q&A sessions to answer all manner of fans' questions, some of which range from, how do I get into this line of work, to, is it true that when the body is decomposing, it blows up? Social media has made us the household name for emergency cleanup services, Spalding says. We have brought humanity to the difficult job our techs perform every day. Although Spalding has faced controversy for some of the cheerful music used in their videos, it seems that at Crime Scene Cleaning are generally regarded as one of the more respectful murder talk content creators. Its more graphic videos contain trigger warnings, it hosts giveaways for armed forces veterans, and it regularly reassures fans that its clients sign a medical release prior to being recorded. But unfortunately, not all creators have the same kind of ideals. If you start looking for more accounts, I would suggest looking at those run by a specific business, says Washington-based Harley. Otherwise, you end up on compilation accounts that are just in it for shock value. Another player on the murder talk scene is an account known as Biocene Recovery. Run by James Monoth, a certified biohazard recovery supervisor whose daughter encouraged him to upload to TikTok, he confessed to having no idea his profession could be so popular and is astounded that he's managed to clock a cool 43,000 followers. His most viral video depicts a blood-stained silhouette imprinted by a decomposing body and has attracted some negativity but he says the majority of comments come from people seeking understanding after losing their loved ones in similar situations. When scrolling through Murder Talk, it's clear to see that one creator works a little differently from the others. An account called At Death Science has almost half a million followers and almost 5 million likes, and is part of a network of social media accounts run by a man named Jeremy Siliberto. Unlike the other creators, the crime scenes in his videos are simulated. Jeremy typically creates scripted and designed hyper-realistic content, not unlike the many fictional crime shows that are adored by the public and he seems to have found a novel approach to educate and have fun, whilst not being overly gruesome nor disrespectful to the topic of death itself. Siliberto's plastic bones and fake crime scenes do nothing to dampen his grim aesthetic or his TikTok popularity. He ends a discussion on the legalities of home burial with, let me know in the comments who you would want to bury in your backyard, injecting dark, absurdist humor without being inconsiderate. Despite Siliberto's talking respectfully of the other creators and understands their reasoning, there can be no controversy about his personal motives. Not only does Siliberto aim to educate people about forensics, he also started Hashtag Gen Z Forest, a movement that encourages young people to opt for more eco-friendly burial options. 
He believes that it is vital that we open up the conversation about death, as well as taming our anxieties about it. Dana from Ohio thinks the popularity of murder talk speaks to generational changes in attitudes towards death. I definitely think my generation is more desensitized to things, she explains. When you go through a national tragedy, like one a year, and it's directly affecting your age group, the fear factors start to wear off and it's accepted as normal and expected. Everyone is kind of drawn to death. We seek it out. We ask for gritty details. She says she feels more comfortable watching crime scene cleanups on TikTok than other more algorithmic friendly content. I also follow plastic surgery accounts and those bother me more than the crime scene cleanups do, she says. I would rather have someone looking at my blood on concrete than my entire semi-naked body with all my flaws pointed out on Instagram. It's objectively disturbing that some young Americans could be more comfortable observing the deaths of other people than showcasing themselves online. And it seems that TikTok, as well as other social media outlets, not only have the capacity to allow us a share in each other's lives, but also in each other's deaths as well. I used to frequently use TikTok watching trick shots, gaming posts, and other comedy clips. There is one guy who I followed though. I won't say his name, but the clips he posted were very unusual. They weren't very nice to be honest. He used to wear this featureless mask and do things like spy on people in their house and frighten them. He even went as far as to attack someone. I gotta say I'm not sure if it was real or not because the clips would end before you could tell, but it felt genuine to me. I'm not proud that I watched this guy harass and assault people, but I did. One day I noticed I had gotten a new follower on TikTok. It was the same guy that I just mentioned. At first I was a bit worried, but shrugged it off. I was in an underground parking lot after I was done grocery shopping. It was late in the evening, so the parking lot was practically empty. Well, it looked empty but I could feel that there was someone there with me. I suddenly became very paranoid. That night I was scrolling through my TikTok and saw a clip that made my heart sink. It was me in the parking lot looking anxiously around my surroundings. It was by the same guy that had followed me on TikTok from earlier. The next two days were the same. I was very paranoid thinking I was being watched and followed. And my suspicions were confirmed because each night that guy had posted it was clips of me. I felt sick and decided to call the police. Unfortunately, they said there wasn't much they could do as no crime had been committed. A week went by and the post stopped. I started to relax thinking maybe he had just moved on and it was all part of his prank thing or whatever. That was until I was attacked outside my house. I was hit over the head with something. I fell to the ground nearly knocked out, but I was still conscious enough for a moment to see. What I saw will haunt me forever. It was a man standing over me with a featureless mask holding a phone up. I passed out, but the next thing I remember was waking up in a hospital. I was found by someone who lived nearby. I told the police of what happened, but his account had been deleted. Whether or not his clips were staged or fake, his assault on me certainly was real. The weird thing I don't understand is why he deleted his account after attacking me. Unlike the other people, I deleted my TikTok. And this incident and the experience has scarred me for life. I just want to tell you, be aware of your surroundings because you never know who could be watching you. And honestly, I would stay off of TikTok and any other social media. I'm a female living in New England. This took place several years ago in a decent neighborhood the day before my 10th birthday. I was arriving home with my mother and my younger brother from one of his soccer games. When we pulled in, my brother noticed a yard sale next door. This house was run down. Apparently some police activity went on there before I was born. But that was over with now, right? 
A man walks up to us and introduces himself. We'll call him Ray. Now, Ray was renting from the woman who owned the place. Basically, this woman had a house with four bedrooms. One for her, one for her disabled son, and the other two rooms were rented out. Ray seemed nice. He played a bit of soccer on the sidewalk with my younger brother and spoke kindly with my mother. He looked a bit trashy, but I didn't care. I just wanted to go inside and play some Minecraft, not thinking much about the ordeal. That was in October. A few months later, in late January, I was barely awake. When my dad came into my room and picked me up out of bed and carried me to the master bedroom where my mom and brother were. The master bedroom is the furthest room away from the house next door. I didn't like being disturbed, so I ran back to my bedroom. My dad then yelled at me, saying that there were police next door and that I should go back into the other room. I did as I was told. I was scared. Apparently, Ray's ex had gone over to the house to pick up some of her things, and she brought her new boyfriend along with her. Ray started stabbing the boyfriend and the police were called, guns drawn and all. I thought that was a one-time instance and that we would be safe after that. March rolls around. My mom picked me up from school as usual. My brother was staying after school for some guitar lessons. She would get him later. I threw my backpack in the trunk and I asked her why there were so many suitcases back there. She cheerfully explained that we were staying at a hotel for the night. We drove around town, and finally she said my dad would take me back home. And suddenly we were no longer staying at a hotel. I thought all of this was very strange. I came home with my dad. I noticed that there was police tape on our lawn. My dad said that they had found drugs in Ray's house. That comment didn't really settle in until later. The full story was... Ray was doing PCP on his front steps. Someone noticed and called the cops. The police came, half chased Ray into the next town over, investigated the house. An officer picked up a package with drugs and immediately begins to have a bad reaction. A biohazard unit had to be called, and they found a drug lab inside the house. The police advised my parents to evacuate. It turns out it wasn't meth so we could come back. But he was manufacturing PCP right next door. My mom arrives home with my brother a few hours after me and dad, and that's when reality sets in. I had an anxiety attack. I couldn't eat, and I sat behind our couch, using it as a makeshift bunker. I couldn't get any sleep on that night. After Ray was released from jail, he goes right back to his illegal lifestyle. Apparently, the evidence room was tampered with, so he couldn't be convicted. Meanwhile, my family has bought a new house, a large dog, security cameras, and plenty of weapons. My brother and I were already attending therapy, but now our sessions happen to be more frequent. We would be moving out in two months. During this time, Ray would watch us from his back porch, just sitting there and staring at us. My dad confronted him once and Ray started shouting death threats at him, which upset me even more. The day we moved, Ray let his pit bull loose. It was in the evening, and he didn't know that we had already left. He just knew it was around the time that we usually walked our dog. A month after moving out, Ray strolled into a local food store. Jacked up on PCP, he tried to kidnap a small child. Thankfully, the kid's parents noticed. Ray dropped the child and tried to hide, but the police eventually caught up with him. But here's a real kicker. He was released from jail a month later because the cells were too full. No transfers, nothing. It was like he was acquitted of all charges. In legal terms, I'm not sure what the outcome of this whole ordeal was. But if he was capable of kidnapping, what could he have done to me? or my younger brother. I have pushed this from the back of my mind in the past couple of months because any activity has seemingly stopped. Yet somehow I knew this silence was too good to be true and eventually we would hear from him again, sooner or later.
It all started a few months ago. A guy messaged me on Facebook and unlike the usual creepy messages I get, this one sounded intelligent and funny. We started chatting from time to time, talking about anything and everything. He said he was divorced with one child, and I kind of empathized every time he would complain about his ex-wife. Even though it also kind of bothered me that he would tell all of these personal details to a virtual stranger. After all, no matter what happened between them, she was still the mother of his kid. Please have some respect. We continued chatting, and I'm getting more relaxed. We were at the stage where we would often discuss our daily lives, and inevitably, I talked about my best friend, with whom I'm extremely close with. We were like sisters, but at that particular time she was very busy with changes happening at her work. She was also having issues with a guy she had met, and things were complicated, and she promised me that she would explain everything in detail when there was more time to meet. Now keep in mind that under normal circumstances I would have known every little detail about it, but as it happened then, there wasn't sufficient time to properly see each other and talk, so I only knew the basics. No names or pictures, etc. So I'm talking to, uh, for the sake of the story, we'll just call him Jake. And I'm beginning to notice that every time we have a conversation, he would casually direct the discussion towards my best friend. We'll call her Jenna. I have mentioned to him that we've known each other since we were babies, and practically grew up together. So he would always ask me to tell him funny stories about our childhood, and our teenage years then proceeded inquiring about what she's like now, and what kind of guy she goes for, etc. I would jokingly ask if he got tired of me, would he want her number? But he would deflect with awkward humor, so I didn't really read too much into it. Some time had passed, and things are a bit calmer at Jenna's work, so we finally got a chance to meet up for drinks. Inevitably, we start talking about Jake, I told her about him and she's smiling and nodding until I take out my phone and show her his pictures. Her face goes pale. She grabs my phone and says, This is him. This is the guy I told you about. At first I assume that she was joking. She is prone to messing with me. But she looks dead serious. So I begin asking questions. It turns out she met him on a dating app. And when they talked, she was under the same impression that I was, that he was smart, charming, and cultured. So when he eventually asked her out, she gladly accepted. They went out, had some drinks, and talked, and everything was fine. Until by the end of the evening, when he got a bit too grabby with her, and was insistent for more than just a goodnight kiss. He offered to drive her home, even though she had taken her own car there, and suggested that he could pick her up in the morning and they could go back together and get her car. Since Jenna didn't want him to know where she stayed, she was annoyed by his advances. She refused and managed to escape him somehow. She told me that she was afraid that Jake would follow her home, so instead, she went to a bar where a friend of hers worked at. The next day, he called her and apologized for his behavior, blaming it on the alcohol and the stress from his job, and then told her that he had to admit something to her because he really liked her and wanted to be honest. She agreed and they met up again. That's when he admitted that he was actually in the process of getting a divorce but hadn't filed for it yet, and he was still living with his wife and small child because she didn't have a job and he couldn't just leave her alone. This was only a temporary thing until she got financially stable. Jenna, being the blunt girl that she is, called bullshit on his story and accused him of being yet another married man out to cheat on his wife and using false excuses for sympathy. The guy worked in sales, so he was really smooth talking and convincing. So I don't know how he managed to appease her doubts at least to the point of not cutting him off right then and there. But some time passes and he chats to her online, calls her and they talk. But Jenna tells him that the only way that they would ever be intimate with each other is that she sees proof that he is actually divorced and lives separately from his ex-wife. 
One day, he calls her up and tells her that he will put his wife on the phone to prove, even though they live together, they sleep in separate rooms and are technically separated. A woman's voice actually confirms that. But this leaves Jenna more puzzled than reassured. She's conflicted because despite everything, she really likes this guy. P why? And is therefore worried not to get herself into a mess if she falls deeper. She's still hesitant to accept his invitations to meet. So one day he... <clears throat> accidentally walks past her workplace at exactly the time she's done with her shift. What are the chances, right? She agrees to go grab a drink with him. As long as they act platonic, he promises. And apparently, that is also when she tells him more about her life, childhood, etc. And that's where I'm brought up in that conversation. He listens to her carefully. And when she compares both timelines, it turns out a few days after that, Jake begins to message me on Facebook. We were both livid, so we decided to confront him separately and then compare notes. When I got back home, I texted him asking why he had lied to me about being divorced, when he was clearly still living with his family, and more importantly, why he even started talking to me when he was apparently seeing my best friend. He was unprepared for that, but he bounced back and gave me some bullshit excuse about how he was just curious about me when he had heard so much from Jenna and wanted to see what I looked like. So he went through her Facebook friends and found me. Mind you, she hadn't added him on Facebook, so he basically stalked her profile to gather that information. Just like when she didn't tell him exactly where she worked, yet he had accidentally, by some miracle, walked past there when Jenna confronted him, he told her that he was just curious and wanted to hear about her from the person who knows her best. She told him that it was wrong and creepy on so many levels, but he insisted that he had no bad intentions and he just allowed his curiosity to get the better of him, etc. When we compared notes after that, Jenna and I just decided to stop talking to him altogether because this guy was clearly a pathological liar and also extremely creepy. We each tell him that we don't want to talk to him or see him ever again, and even though he was shocked and tries to convince us otherwise, he eventually accepts that and says that if we ever change our mind, he'll be happy to talk. We think it's over. Oh, how naive we were. At first, he seemed to take it well, but then he would, again, quote, accidentally send a picture or message that was intended for somebody else, but mistakenly sent it to me or Jenna, so he could initiate a conversation. He would attempt to ask her or me out again, get denied, and then retreat again, until the next message or call. Then the random bumping into each other ensued. Whenever we would go out, on my way to work, or to the market, to the cafe, or Jenna's gym. He would be there. Of course, all of this was random coincidence. We were more annoyed than scared at this point. We still thought he was a lying piece of shit, but ultimately harmless. So there wasn't much that we could do, except wait it out and hope that he would eventually move on. <sighs> Wrong. One day Jenna comes to my place, freaked out. She tells me that she was on a date with a new guy, and she saw Jake passing by the restaurant she was in, and then later called her in hysterics, screaming at her. Look what you did. I can't get you out of my mind. Because of you, I got so angry I hit my child and chased my wife out of the house. She got fed up with him and responded, and told him to never bother her again and go seek a therapist because he clearly has issues, and then she blocked him. That creeped us both out, because not only was he not moving on, he seemed to have been escalating and becoming aggressive. I told her that if he calls her again, she should threaten to call the police and report him for being allegedly abusive toward his family. 
We were in the middle of discussing this when I got a call from an unknown number. I normally don't pick those up, but I was also waiting for a package to be dropped off and thought that it might be the delivery man, but it was Jake. He was crying into the phone, sobbing and pleading with me to convince Jenna to unblock him, that it wasn't fair and I had to help him. He sounded insane. I was shocked to hear him in this state. It was such a contrast to his normally smooth demeanor. So I calmly told him to start acting like a grown man and to calm down. It wasn't my place to convince Jenna of anything after she had made up her mind, especially after him acting crazy and the claims about hitting his child and chasing his wife out. He then told me that he didn't really do that, but just wanted to make Jenna feel guilty and scare her into talking to him. He began to apologize profusely and said that he was at his wit's end and didn't know what to do. I told him that he had gone way too far and that if he ever proceeded to contact or stalk us again, we would go to the police. I hung up on him and blocked him as well. The police threat seemed to work and we haven't heard from him in about two months. But yesterday Jenna and I were at a mutual friend's birthday party and guess who was the birthday girl's plus one? This is something that happened back when I was in high school. During that time, I lived at home with my parents and brother. We also had two dogs. Usually, just about every day, the dogs would be walked. It would either be me, my brother, or my parents walking them. One night, it was probably like 8 p.m. and the sun was setting. The weather was pretty nice though, and the dogs needed to go for their walk. My parents decided to take them, and my brother was at his friend's house. I was having a hard time with my homework, so I stayed home alone when they left. When my parents walked the dogs, I never really quite knew how long it would be. Our neighborhood was pretty quiet, but it was also pretty large. There were lots of streets and houses in the general area, and there was also a park not that far away. Sometimes it would be like 20 to 30 minutes for the walk, and other times it would be over an hour. I was up in my bedroom when my parents told me they were leaving, and I said bye from up in my bedroom and then heard them walk out. After that, I tried hard to focus on my homework. It was some math assignment, and I just couldn't seem to understand it. I was trying my best to figure it out though, and I lost track of time. The next thing I knew, I heard the front door downstairs opening. I automatically assumed that it was my parents getting back, and I remained focused on what I was doing. But several moments later, I realized that that wasn't right. If my parents were home, I would have heard the dogs with them. The only thing that I had heard when the door opened was somebody walking inside. I never heard my parents' voices or the dogs or anything. I stopped doing my homework. Then I stood up and walked to the doorway. I listened closely to who was inside of our house. I heard nothing but silence. Now I didn't know what was going on. Clearly, it wasn't either of my parents, and I knew that it wasn't my brother either. I thought about going downstairs to look around, but for some reason, I just felt like that was a really bad idea. Instead, I quietly shut my door and went back inside of my room. I couldn't really focus anymore on schoolwork. I was replaying in my head, hearing the door open and close, and wondering if I had imagined the whole thing. Looking back, I was starting to question myself. Then, out of nowhere, I heard the sound of somebody walking up the stairs. The footsteps reached the top and then started to approach my bedroom. I began to panic and was really scared that whoever it was would go into my room. I did not have a lock on my door, so they would be able to just walk right in if they wanted. When the footsteps reached my room, they walked right past. Whoever it was was going to the end of the hallway. Back there was a bathroom and my parents' bedroom as well as the guest bedroom. My brother's was right across the hall. I heard whoever it was reach near where my parents' bedroom and the guest bedroom were, and without even giving it much thought, I ran to my doorway, opened it, and sprinted for the stairs. I didn't look at all to see who was actually inside of the house. I felt like this was my best opportunity to get away. When I had raced down the stairs, I ran directly for the front door. I then went outside and started running for the street. I couldn't tell you if whoever was in the house with me went after me or not. My memory of it all is just a blur. When I got back out to the street, I just started jogging until I saw my parents with the dogs. They saw me running and wanted to know what was up. I told them that somebody went inside the house. My dad called the police and we waited a distance away until they arrived. 
My parents had left the door unlocked after leaving. Our neighborhood was not known to have crime, really, so this was a big deal. The police got there, and only then did we return to our house. When we got back, whoever had been inside the house was now gone. They didn't even steal anything. After that experience, we always locked our doors. In the weeks that followed, there were two reports of burglaries just a few blocks away. I think that it was probably the same person. I know a guy was caught in connection with them, but I really don't know if he was the same person who went inside our house or not. I don't really know if there's a way to prove it either. I'm just glad I got out of there when I did. There was no way I was going to stay in the house with the guy just down the hallway from me. That was one of the scariest moments of my life. A strange thing happened to me a couple of years ago. At the time, I lived in an apartment by myself. It was a one bedroom, one bathroom place, and I lived on the second floor of the building. Overall, the apartment was not the nicest, and it didn't have that many units in it either. I knew a few of my neighbors, but not all of them. One night, I was at home by myself, like usual. It was sometime at night, I really don't know exactly the time, but there was a knock on my door. I walked over and answered it, without giving it that much thought. A man was standing there. He was kind of short and had dark brown hair. The man told me that he was my neighbor from down the hallway, and he pointed a ways to the left. He asked me if he could come inside of my apartment to make a phone call. He said that his Wi-Fi was not working, and he didn't have any service on his phone at the time, so without the Wi-Fi, he couldn't make any calls. I was not comfortable with this. I told the man sorry but no. He said that he would be really fast, and I told him that I really couldn't help him. He kind of came across as a little bit sketchy to me for some reason. The man turned to walk away, and I closed my door. I was really curious afterwards. I had never seen the man before, and had seen most of the people who lived in the building because it wasn't all that big. I thought maybe the guy would knock on another person's door, and I quietly opened my door and looked around the corner to see him walking away. He walked all the way to the end of the hall, and then he went inside of the elevator. I was suspicious that he didn't even live here. At one point or another, I had seen just about everyone that lived on my floor. After the man left, I went to one of the windows in my place. I looked out of it and to the guest parking lot where the main doors open up to. Now, there are assigned parking spaces for all the residents and those are under the building. There's a small guest parking lot with like 10 spaces out front. I saw the man leave the building and then walk to an older looking car in the guest parking lot and drive away. He definitely didn't live here. So why would he lie to me and claim that he did? I didn't know, but the fact that he wanted me to let him inside of my apartment kind of creeps me out. He certainly made up the whole story about his Wi-Fi being down and him not having any cell phone service. I'm not sure how he got into the building in the first place, but most likely somebody else let him in when they were entering. After that night, I never saw him again. That pretty much confirmed to me that he didn't live there. I'm really glad that I didn't let him inside of my apartment. I'm a female who is currently 30 years old and this took place late last year in early November. My fiance and I had just bought a boating company in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. At the time we lived in LA and because we had bought the company, we had to move to Florida to maintain it. Life was kind of what you'd expect for Florida. It rained a lot and was almost tropical during the summer months. If you've been to Florida or live there, you'll probably relate to what I'm saying. Anyway, we had moved into a large one-storied home appropriate for a family of four. We didn't have kids, but the house wasn't too expensive and we needed to find a new place. For the first month or so, the move had been well and we started to adapt to the new environment. In other words, things were going well for the most part. One day, my fiancé had gone into the office while I was homesick with the flu. At one point during the day, I remember going into the kitchen to get a snack to just have something in my stomach. Upon entering the kitchen full of unopened boxes, I for some reason get a weird feeling. It wasn't a bad feeling, but rather a feeling that made me alert or something. You know that feeling you get when you feel like someone's watching you? 
Yeah, I had that in spades. I hesitate before looking out the sliding glass door to see someone walking around my vegetable garden. By the looks of it, they looked like a younger adult in all black wearing a satchel. Now, this house had a gate on the side that only opened if you had the password. However, the password wasn't working, which indicated that he jumped the fence. The thing that really caught my eye was that he appeared to be pouring something around the garden. My initial instinct was to call my fiancé, but realized that he would get worried and try to take this into his own hands. Without any other options, I pick up the phone to call the police. The operator said they'd try to have someone there soon, but to just stay hidden in the meantime. This person continues to look around the garden as I run to my room and lock my door. All the while, I'm on my bed praying to God that he doesn't come inside or break in. Minutes felt like hours before hearing the police sirens from down the road. They got louder as they pulled into my house where I then heard some sort of commotion going on. Upon going outside, I see four police officers restraining this kid who appeared to be an older teen. However, he didn't try to get away. He kind of just stood there, accepting his defeat. As I spoke with the police, I then learned a shocking truth I didn't expect to hear. While they were restraining him, they managed to find several traces of liquid mercury, which is what he was using to put in our garden. It was then where I called my fiancé where he had to leave work to come home. Turns out, this teenager was actually our next door neighbor's son. Both his parents were devastated, apologizing to us for his actions. While we understood their pain, we ended up filing charges against the son for attempted murder. How he got a container of mercury, we have no idea. I'm still very thankful I caught him in the act, as I'm not sure if I'd still be writing this had I eaten the vegetables. He was arrested and put in jail for 10 years according to his parents. Later that same day, his parents had told us that their son was innocent and that he was just looking at our garden. Me, nor my fiancé, wanted to hear it. This is something that happened a few years ago. I buy things on eBay here and there and have been doing so for years. I like to collect things like sports memorabilia and occasionally I bid on auctions. One time, I saw this autographed football that was signed by one of my favorite players. It had zero bids, and the starting bid was pretty low. I expected it to go way up, but I entered my maximum bid and then moved on, thinking maybe I had a shot at winning it. The auction still had several days left. Over the next few days, I actually forgot all about it. Then, I got a notification that I had won the auction and I could pay for the signed ball now. When I looked, I couldn't believe it. Not one single other person had bid on the ball, and I had won. I don't remember the exact price. I think it was maybe like $10. It was probably worth a lot more, maybe over $50. I was really excited and paid the money. The very next night, though, I was at home when my phone rang. During this time, I had a landline phone that I had for years. I did not recognize the number on the caller ID, so I didn't answer it. What followed shortly after was a message. A man's voice came onto my answering machine, and he said that he was trying to reach me and mention my name. He said that I had won his auction for the football, and unfortunately nobody else bid on it. Then he said that I was getting way too good of a deal, and it wasn't fair at all, but he was going to do me a favor and mail it anyways. He went on to say that he expects me to leave him a very good review after this. Now, this rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't like how he called me up on my personal phone to say this. I won his auction fair and square. If he didn't want the risk of somebody paying $10 for it, then he shouldn't have started the bidding so low. He knew the risks. I went on eBay and looked at some other listings of the same player's autograph on a football. They were going for a little over $50, so the guy lost out on about 40 bucks. It's not that big of a deal. Just two days later, I received the football in the mail. It was fast shipping, because I guess the guy lived in the same state as me. After receiving the football, it was packaged well and just how it looked online. I went on eBay to leave the good review that the seller wanted so badly. 
To be honest, I really didn't want to leave him a good review after what he did. It kind of annoyed me. But when I logged into eBay, I noticed that he had already left me a negative review. On eBay, sellers and buyers can leave each other reviews. You can leave it positive, negative, or neutral. This affects your feedback, and people are less likely to buy or sell to you if you have a bad rating. Mine had been perfect to that point, and his was pretty good. I think it was like 99% positive. His negative review of me said, buyer got way too good of a deal. Clearly, he was upset about it, but I did not feel that it was fair for him to leave me a bad review. What was I supposed to do? I bid and I won. Did he expect me to offer to pay more for no reason? It angered me that he left me a bad review, so I left him a bad review. I said what happened. I said, I won the auction from this seller for a good deal. He then called my home phone complaining and demanded that I leave him a good review. He sent me a message after this, which I ignored. I didn't even open it. Then, the next day, he called me again. I didn't answer, and he left another message. This one was very angry. He berated me for about three minutes straight. I didn't even listen to the whole thing and deleted it, but this didn't stop him. He called me again several times the next day. I got frustrated, and luckily I had call blocker installed on my landline. I blocked his number so that he would finally stop bothering me. For several days, everything was fine. But then, one night, I was at home, and out of nowhere got a knock on my front door. I walked down to the front door, but before opening it, looked outside. It was a man who I did not recognize. I didn't know why he would be here. I answered the door, and the man standing there mentioned my name and asked if that was me. I said yes. He then told me that he sold me a football on eBay not long ago. As soon as I heard that, I slammed the door right in his face. This caused him to start aggressively banging on my door. I yelled at him to go away or I was calling the cops. He was yelling and demanding that I give him the ball back, saying that I scammed him. I couldn't believe this guy. I'm not sure if he was really just mad about the ball at this point or if he was just mad at me. He kept standing there and knocking on my door every so often. After he didn't leave for over 10 minutes, I called the police on him. When they arrived about 10 minutes after that, the man was still there. They spoke with him, and he gave his side of the story, which I'm not even sure what that was. An officer came inside and spoke to me, and said that the man outside kept claiming that I scammed him and stole his autographed football. I told the officer the whole story, and I showed him eBay proof on my phone. After a while, the police ruled in favor of me. They said that the transaction was fair, and I owned the football. They told the man that he had to leave my property, and told him not to come back. Eventually, the man agreed and left. After that, I never heard from him again. I still have the football, and every time I look at it, I laugh when I remember the crazy story that goes with it. Several months ago, I sold my PlayStation 5 on eBay. My friend was getting rid of his PS5 for an Xbox, so he sold it to me for a really good price. His PlayStation 5 was a little bit nicer than the version that I had, so I decided to sell mine. I listed it for a good price on eBay as a buy it now rather than an auction. Somebody bought it after just two days and the very next day I packaged it up really good and shipped it. I sent it to the address that was given from the eBay account that bought it from me. Now three days after I shipped the PlayStation and four days after it was sold, I got a message on eBay from the buyer. He told me that he recently moved and forgot to put his new address on his eBay account. Then he asked me that I ship it to his new address instead. I responded and told him that I already shipped the PlayStation several days ago and that it was too late. The guy freaked out, saying that I should give him a refund because he wasn't going to get it. I told him that he should have realized that, either before he bought it or within the first day. What was I supposed to do? Sit around waiting for his blessing for me to ship it? I mean, normally, people want things shipped as fast as possible after they buy it. He said that he was going to report me to eBay, but that didn't really scare me because I knew I had done nothing wrong. I told the guy that the package will have his name on it, so he should either go to his old address and pick it up, or contact whoever now lives there and ask them to send it to him. In my mind, that was a very logical solution. Obviously, if it was at the wrong address, there was a chance that somebody would steal it, but I mailed it in a box where it wasn't obvious that it was a PS5. The guy did not seem to think my ideas were good. He just told me that he needed a refund, and he kept threatening me, saying that he would have my eBay account banned. I told him that I wasn't going to refund him. Over the next few days, the guy kept harassing me, sending me messages. 
He kept saying that I had to give him a refund. He really wanted the money, but I wasn't going to give it to him. I just ignored him. So about a week later, I was looking at some of the messages that he sent me, and I decided to look him up, just for the heck of it. His username seemed to be his actual name. It was a first name, an underscore, and then a last name and a bunch of numbers. The last name was somewhat unique sounding, so I thought that I might be able to find him. I wanted to know what this guy looked like that was harassing me so much. I went onto Facebook and entered his name. Just one result came up, and it was a younger looking man. His page was public, so I could see everything that he posted and stuff, and he was quite active. I scrolled down just a little bit and saw a post that nearly blew my mind. He had posted a picture of a PlayStation 5 with the caption, Just got this bad boy in the mail. Hit me up if you want to play some COD. The PlayStation looked just like the one that I had sold, and it was dated just three days after I had mailed the PlayStation, and the very same day that the guy told me that he had the wrong address. This guy was totally trying to scam me. It was a pretty bad attempt too, to be honest. I screenshotted the post and then sent it to him on eBay. The guy claimed that it wasn't him. Then he backtracked and said that it was his friend's PS5, not his. Then he backtracked again and called me a curse word. After that, I never heard from him again. I buy things on eBay all the time. I've bought things from video games to phones and even computers. I've also sold a couple of items as well. This is something that took place just last year. My mom's birthday was coming up and I wanted to get her a new phone because the one that she was using was old and slow. She uses an iPhone and I think she had like a 7 or 8 or something. I was looking up newer ones and was trying really hard to find a great deal. I should have just paid a fair price and bought one from one of those companies that refurbish them. That way you know what you're getting and everything is handled professionally. But instead, I got carried away trying to get the best deal. I was constantly scouring the latest listings and auctions. I found one that was a really good deal. It was selling for about $100 less than I would expect to pay for the phone. It was still several hundred dollars though. There were a few pictures of the phone in what appeared to be the person's house. In the listing, the seller said that it worked great, but they had gotten a different phone and no longer needed it. It seemed legit, and I looked at the seller, and they didn't have any other items for sale, but did have a 99% rating. When I saw where the seller was located, I noticed that it was in a city very close to me, only like 30 minutes away. That meant it would probably only take like a day or two to ship. I decided to buy it and felt really good with the money that I would be saving. A couple of days later and the phone arrived in the mail. As soon as I unboxed it though, I realized that I had been scammed. The phone that I received was not even close to what I bought. It was one of those cheap Android phones that you can get for like $40 at Walmart. I really couldn't believe it. I went onto eBay and compared what it said I bought versus what I received. I had gotten scammed badly. I contacted the seller, demanding an explanation. When I did, I got no response. After not hearing back from him, I contacted eBay and reported his profile as well. I now saw that he had another listing of the same phone that I bought. I left a negative review, warning anybody else and telling them what had happened. I hoped that nobody else would fall for his scam. After several days of trying to contact the seller and communicating with eBay, things finally got resolved. I was able to get a refund from my bank and I was told that the account got suspended as well. I was able to buy my mom an actual iPhone for her birthday. I was still mad about what happened though, but not long after I found out the account had been banned, I think the same night or else the next one, it was late at night and I was literally in bed about to fall asleep. I was on my phone until I got tired. It was probably a little bit after midnight and suddenly I heard a loud bang at the back of my house. During that time, I rented a smaller house which I lived by myself in. I got up from my bed and walked to the doorway. The sound came from the back of my house on the other side. Then I heard it again. It was followed by another bang, which I could hear was from the kitchen window at the back of the house. My bedroom was at the front of the house, so it was a ways away, but I could still hear it very clearly because of how loud it was. Somebody was there. I heard whoever was there start hitting the window repeatedly. I didn't waste any time and went back inside my bedroom and locked the door behind me. Then I got my phone and called the police. I told them that it sounded like somebody was trying to break into my house. Shortly after, I heard glass breaking. They had succeeded in breaking in. I let the police know and they said that some officers should arrive shortly. Then I heard more loud noises. This time inside, 
It sounded like whoever was inside was just destroying things or hitting everything in sight. I heard glass breaking, chairs falling over, and other loud noises. This went on for about a minute straight, and then stopped. Things became very silent after. I heard a little bit of noise coming from the back of the house, as if somebody was walking. Then that stopped too, and everything was completely silent. I remained in my room until the police got there. When I came out of my room, I saw that everything in my kitchen had been all messed up. My back window was smashed, glass was all over the place, and lots of other things were on the floor. Several dishes and cups had been smashed. My table and chairs in the kitchen were all knocked over. Lots of things from the cabinet were on the floor, and I saw several dents in the cabinets and furniture. They basically just trashed my kitchen and left. I told the police everything that I could, and then they left. I stayed with my parents for the rest of the night, and the entire next week as well. My window got replaced, and I got some new furniture. I only lived in that house for a few months after, and I don't live there anymore. Since then, everything's been fine, but I never found out who did it. I truly believe that it was the person who scammed me on eBay. I think they were angry that I got their account taken down. If they were running that blatant of a scam, there's no telling what they could do. Plus, they knew my address from shipping me the phone, and I had seen that they lived not very far away from me. Luckily, I don't live there anymore. Hopefully, nobody else gets scammed. The pandemic forced a lot of people to search for new employments and opportunities, especially during the initial economic onset. Uber Eats, DoorDash, Amazon, all of them saw crazy surges in traffic when cities ordered people to stay indoors. Many places deem these drivers essential workers, which kept me employed for several unstable months throughout COVID. I became a delivery driver out of necessity back then, but actually still had to do it part-time on the weekends still. My story takes place during 2020, when no one really knew what the future had in store. I was working for a big name delivery company, one of the largest cities in the United States. At the time, I was constantly behind by at least a day's worth of deliveries, if not more. Strikes are going on. People are ordering more stuff than ever before. It was a lot to handle and had made a pretty high stress work environment. One day, I see a meme about how all we do is pee into water bottles and then lose packages. Honestly, it was the golden age for delivery driver memes. Because of how behind I was on my route, I started working overtime pretty much every day. Instead of delivering from 9 to 5, I'd start at 8 in the morning and then just go until I was totally burnt out, which is usually around 7 p.m., maybe a little longer if I had a Red Bull that day. It was one of my last packages for the night, and I remember thinking to myself that it could just wait till the morning and be my first delivery the next day. I was really hungry and just wanted to put my feet up. But the destination was nearby. I'm a go-getter. So I just went. And the parcel was no bigger than my fist. It wasn't spending the night in my truck, so... I wish I wasn't so stubborn. Why didn't I just go home like I wanted to? The essential worker tag was going to my head. I pull up outside of this apartment complex. And I'm talking chalk line outlines on the sidewalk. Caution tape rippling in the breeze. Not literally, but you get what I mean. Groups of guys patrolling the parking lot milling around the dark corner, big dogs barking from every tiny gate, bullet holes in some of the cars. I'm in a big city, and some of the underbelly is seedy, almost unsightly. I scan the package in my hand, and I leave the truck and search the actual address. From what I can see, it seems to be a ground floor resident, and thank God I don't have to climb 10 flights of stairs just to hand off this bulk chapstick, or whatever the hell it is. I locked the truck behind me just to be safe. There's nothing in it to steal, but this neighborhood is just not worth gambling in. After perusing around, I find the building that it's actually in, and then finally the unit. It's a dingy corner apartment with all the windows covered with all kinds of crazy shit. Tin foil, movie posters, food boxes, like cereal, you name it. It's all blocking the light out of this dump. I get a weird feeling the second I see it, but hey, I'm almost out of here. I walk around to the front and find a guy leaning against a tree, smoking a cigarette. I gave him a courtesy nod to which he offers a two-finger salute. Standard guy exchange in my city. I turn my heel and approach the front door. I've already decided I don't want to be here anymore, so I hit the bell and place the package on the floor. As I'm standing back up, the door rips open in front of me with this agitated energy. It's every driver's nightmare on shift. The irritated, panicked where 
You have to be recipient of whoever wants to jam you up like they're a cop. As I get upright, I can see this is different though. This guy is real thin, half dressed and just covered in what I can only assume to be track marks. Dirty, unwashed and the living room behind him was disgusting. We make eye contact, I say hello and then I turn to leave. What the hell man, I've been waiting for you all day, he shouts at me. I turn back around and shrug, offer my normal apology. Hey, we're understaffed man, what more can I say? Well, I think I saw you drop my package, no? I come to a full stop. I have no idea what this guy is talking about. I point at the one at his feet and asked if he meant that one. Yeah, man, I watched you throw it against the door. It's probably broken. I start to argue, but the whole thing is a racket. The guy behind me smoking a cigarette is a friend of the guy in the apartment. And the guy in the apartment says, Hey, did you see him do it? And of course, cigarette guy nods and says, Yep, I saw the whole thing. Now this is turning into an actual problem. Not just them trying to report me or something, but being surrounded by potentially dangerous criminals. They try to usher me inside the apartment so we can get it all worked out. But I have my own protocol to follow, and right near the top of the list is never get made to go anywhere, especially on shift. The guy in the apartment pulls out a gun right out of his pants pocket then points it right at my face. The entire conversation stops and we're all just looking at the trigger, waiting. He asked me to reconsider going inside and that all of this is just a big misunderstanding. The guy with the cigarette puts his smoke out, grabs my elbow, and then leads me inside. My heart is pounding through my chest at this point. Anything could happen. After we get into the living room and they shut the door, all of my suspicions are confirmed. This place is a crack house without a doubt. And these two clowns are a couple of dealers. Radical. Exactly where I want to be. The guy puts the pistol away pretty much the second they got the door locked. He seemed even nervous to have it out, which did come as a relief to me. Not a fan of him waving it around either. The scariest part was actually the door. Once they got me inside, the whole situation devolved into an episode of the Three Stooges. They tried to call my office for 15 minutes. They were so strung out, they couldn't even look at the phone for longer than a minute to actually pull up the number and then hit dial. From what I gathered, these guys have run out of whatever they were actually addicted to and were filling out the cravings with whatever they could get their hands on. To say these guys were high wasn't accurate. They looked like they hadn't slept in days, running on fumes of whatever dust was left at the bottom of the bag. That's when they came up with the scam that they were trying to pull. Like everyone else, They'd seen dozens of videos online of careless drivers dumping packages over fences and things like that. So they ordered something small and cheap off of Amazon, then painstakingly waited at the door for it to arrive, just to peg a fake crime on an innocent, unsuspecting driver. I wondered how long that guy had been leaning up against the tree, waiting for me to show up. They were completely crazy. It was actually kind of entertaining. They thought they were going to get a payout of some kind, right in the middle of the night. Like us delivery guys carry a little fallback cash just in case we break something. I couldn't quite understand the logic, but I appreciate the desperation. I encouraged them just a little, just to see how far they'd actually go. How much more they'd come up with to justify all this craziness. Trying to get them to just focus on the phone was the funniest part though. I had to keep it within reason. These guys did force me in here. They did have a gun. So it wasn't all fun and games or anything. Something got their attention in the back of the apartment. Both of their heads snapped and they reacted to something that I couldn't see or hear. I'm assuming it was just typical hallucinations from staying awake for so long. Either way, they both thought that they could hear someone breaking in and sneaking around the back bedroom. One of them is turning the drawers in the kitchen upside down looking for a flashlight. The other guy's just yelling, keeping an eye on the dark hall in front of him. They don't find a flashlight, but they're both holding cell phones and this seems to be kind of my chance, so... I tell them, both of their phones have a flashlight. They just have to turn it on. They both go mental at this realization and frantically flick their lights on. They tell me to keep an eye on the front door and watch their backs. I nod like we're old war buddies and I'd never let them down. As they went down the hallway and checked the rooms, I slowly shuffled back to the door and unlatched the deadbolt. The last thing I saw was the glare of the cell phone lights against the dingy back wall. 
and the shaky silhouettes of the pistol going from one room to the other. Absolute chaos. I wasn't out of the woods yet though. I still needed to get back to my truck in the sketchy complex and then navigate my way out of the slums and back into the city. It was much later than I thought and all I wanted to do was just get home. I went from a walk to a light jog as to not draw too much attention. Everything was going smoothly until I reached the parking lot when I hear something behind me. I still don't know exactly what I heard, but it sounded like someone running up on me. So I whirled around and there's no one there. All right, now I'm hearing things. As I turn to face back into the parking lot, I rotate just in time and step into the angled antenna of one of the car that's nearest to me. It had been bent at the base, so it just jutted out instead of going straight up and down. That antenna was also perfectly level with my eye, and it pushed right beneath the lid and then right behind my actual eye. I harpooned my own face in a mad dash to get the hell out of this place. There was no grace in that reaction. In a panic, I flailed backward to get away from whatever was causing the pain, only to injure myself worse. That antenna had a little bead on the end, which I could feel putting pressure between my eye. That metal rod must have been inside my eye at least an inch or two. When I pulled myself backwards, all of it slid out the same way it went in, and the pain was beyond all measure. Droplets of blood are now leaking from the base of my eye. I was stuck within 15 feet of the security of my delivery truck, but I can't see the keys to open up the door. I stumbled to the back and sat on the bumper, just holding my eye and praying that it didn't fall out. After around 45 minutes, my vision cleared up a little, but the pain was still explosive. I managed to get back into the truck and then slowly drive back toward my house, as we didn't have to return them if we were behind. We just swap it out for a totally new, fully loaded truck in the morning. My eye thankfully didn't fall out, but I did require some pretty involved visits to the doctor for around 18 months after that. I like to think that those crackheads are still holed up in that apartment looking for a phantom burglar. They probably don't even remember taking me hostage. When I was 19 years old, I still lived at home with my parents and little brother. They were going out of town for some weekend getaway trip, but I was at the angsty stage where I only wanted to do my own thing, even if that meant foregoing a legitimate good time. The truth was that I was incredibly hungover. I was early on in my drinking career and had a long night of boozing the night before. I felt so sick that all I wanted to do was lay down and just be alone. I definitely didn't have the stomach to be with my family for 72 hours straight. I coughed up some excuse and they left me behind. You might ask yourself what I had planned for this epic little weekend. No house parties, no spin the bottle, no drugs or music. The first thing I did was cut all my hair. This was around the time Britney Spears shaved her head. It was on every news station in America. I low-key thought it was kind of badass to just go against what everyone thought about you. I was getting ready to ship off to college at the time, so the notion of a self-reinvention was very exciting. Chopping off my hair seemed to be the quickest, most convenient route of rebellion. After the impromptu haircut, I went to the bathroom for a mini spa afternoon face masks, moisturizers, and I even cranked up the shower to make it all steamy. After an hour of lounging in the bathroom and getting all the hair cleaned up, I stepped out into the hallway naked as the day I was born. Moving naked through the house is a prized pastime for many homebodies and I was no exception. I went into the kitchen to find a snack and just kind of zoned out as I looked out the window. I glanced down to the bag I'm eating out of and I see a note on the counter. That's weird, I think. I don't remember my parents leaving me a note. At first glance, I recognize right away that it's not any handwriting I know. It reads, I was going to leave you a letter, but I see that you're still here. My blood runs cold. Still here. Who the hell wrote this? I can feel the water dripping down my back, reminding me of just how vulnerable I am. It's the middle of the day, and still, I'm worse off than a sitting duck. There's a creak down the hallway. I make the split decision and barrel towards my bedroom. Can't do anything without clothes. I'd rather get murdered than run onto the street naked. There's someone standing there though. I enter the room and find a man. Tall, dark clothing with greasy hair hanging in his face. 
the moment I step into the room, cracks this broad smile, and it's the creepiest thing I've ever seen. The only thing I can do is scream bloody murder right at the top of my lungs. His smile fades and he takes a step towards me, almost apologetically. That's when I recognize him. This weird guy that I dated my freshman year. We were an item for about three weeks before he ran away from home, and I mean ran away. No one saw or heard from him for months. The actual local myth was that he'd been found one city over and was homeschooled now. Regardless, here he stood, grinning in my bedroom. He reached behind himself, grabbed my clothes off the bed, and then hands them to me. I proceeded to dress myself in the most awkward situation I can possibly imagine. He didn't even act like he was doing anything wrong, which was creepy, but also a comfort, kind of like a little kid or something. He makes me sit down on the bed after I get dressed. Honestly, he didn't do anything weird or violent. He didn't threaten or hurt me, other than breaking into my house. He heard I was moving away and wanted to see me before I left. He said he'd been thinking about the past a lot, and that freshman year was his favorite. We didn't date long, but it held a special memory for him. We talked for a couple of hours, and then he left. I never saw him again, but I did hear a couple of years later that he was fully institutionalized for schizophrenia. That definitely added up when everything was said and done, but made me feel a little uneasy after the fact. How long was he in my house without me knowing that day? And worse than that, could he have possibly hurt me? Lock your doors when you decide to stay home alone. I live in a small country where things still go bump in the night, and that doesn't go for just creepy local legends. Dark strangers, cartels, I think you get the idea. Where I live, nowhere is truly removed from the day-to-day -day dangers of the unknown. It was a dark night. I found myself home alone. Here, it isn't uncommon for the entire family to live together. Grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren will all share a growing piece of property for wealth and security. It's the simplest way to live. But as you can imagine, being home alone is a rarity. With so many people under one roof, it's almost impossible to time anything just right to ever be actually alone. So I did what I always do. I hooked up the surround sound throughout the living room and turned out all the lights. I bundled up on the couch with my favorite snack and watched whatever I desired on the big family television. Despite the ever-present danger I mentioned earlier, I remember the evening being quite relaxing. Rain and a breeze moved in along the coast and created a pitter-patter against the roof. As the night went on, I thought I heard someone at the front door. As I moved to investigate, the sound and movement stopped. But being a stormy night, and that I had the sound up so loud, I truly in my heart believed I'd simply heard something that wasn't there. I turned back to the movie and did my best to relax. That's when the back door began to rattle. I adjust myself on the sofa to get a better look. When someone starts to knock, a frantic, heavy banging against the hardwood. I froze in place. Whatever I dismissed as storm sounds, or maybe just the junk blowing around in the backyard, is now undeniable. There's someone trying to come inside the house. Everyone who lives there naturally has a key. Whoever is outside the door clearly does not. At the time, I'm an 18-year-old man. I'm running through the logical scenarios in my head. Whoever this is, they tried to open up the front door, then slip around the side of the house and is now trying to force the back door open. This isn't cartel or a monster. Anything with real bloodlust would have forced the front door open. I reason that it's a common thief, probably someone very nervous and trying to remain unseen. Being 18, I decide to take them head on and show the world this asshole picked the wrong house. I move from the couch to the kitchen, grab the biggest cleaver I can find. 10 inches of dingy, ugly steel. Still, the door handle is twisting back and forth. Go time. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm down for whatever. There's nothing like the mentality of a teenager. You don't know who you're messing with! I shouted through the door. The stranger on the other side stopped shaking the handle for a moment. I know you're out there. You have three seconds to get the f out of here, or I'll cut you up. They didn't care. The knocking started again, even harder than before. 
My confidence quickly faded. I took a deep breath and readied myself. In my head, this was do or die. Hoisting the cleaver over my head, I unfastened the bolt and threw open the door before me. It wasn't a burglar or a gangster of any kind. It was my sweet little grandma. She stood there soaking wet with an expression of agitation, but also unmistakable terror. What are you doing? She shouted at me. Me? What are you doing at the back door? I asked. I thought you were an intruder. No, no, no. She laughed as she stepped inside the house. I went and paused the television while she shed her coats by the door. She explained that she'd gotten home during the storm, tried knocking for a while. That was the noise I heard at the front door. I guess she knocked for quite a while because she finally gave up and decided to try the back door. The front entrance has a little cover, so she figured that even if it were locked, at least she would be out of the rain. That's when I started to hear the commotion and decided to go to war with whatever was outside. Glad I didn't though, because I seriously almost killed my grandma. I played softball throughout high school. This meant I got home an hour or two later than school actually let out. Regardless, I was still the first one home more often than not. My parents worked well into the afternoon, and my sister participated in various clubs and after-school events like theater club. I got home one day to the usual scene. Fully locked house. Lights are off. Note from my mom in the kitchen. I let my dog out in the backyard, changed out of my uniform, and opened up a bag of Cheetos. Very average, very typical day. My dog scratched to let me know he was bored and to let him inside. Dog and I cuddle on the couch and start watching our favorite shows. Out of nowhere, I hear a door slam open. It's beneath me, downstairs in the basement. I could feel it vibrate through the floorboards. I know this sounds weird, but this wasn't out of the ordinary. The basement was like a downstairs apartment. And my older sister lived down there. The basement had its own entry door to the outside, and she could be pretty careless with her coming and going. Our parents had spoken to her multiple times about letting the door slam open and closed. So honestly, I didn't think twice about it. I kept watching TV and eating my Cheetos. My dog, however, got up and moseyed down the stairs. Again, this wasn't odd, but what was odd was the silence that followed. No smooching or petting, no excited cheers. The dog went downstairs and that was that. Still, I continued watching TV. Maybe she was just in a bad mood down there. After a few minutes, I see movement in the front yard. I turn to find my dog, the one that was just with me on the couch, running up and down the block. He's a big, dumb, and overly friendly Labrador who is not allowed out front. My sister definitely knows this, so I'm thinking, what the hell is she doing? I get off the couch and go down to the basement stairwell. The lights are off. It's eerily quiet. I'm starting to feel all the things that are out of place, the peculiar things that I should have noticed earlier. I reach the basement landing and see the door wide open to the outside world. There's mud tracked in a few steps, and a boot print placed squarely in the center of the door. As I near, I could tell somebody kicked that ground level door in for whatever reason. Robbery, rape, murder, the list really only gets worse. Once they heard the television upstairs and the dog coming down to check the bottom floor, they must have gone back out the way they came and left the door wide open. I told everyone what happened when they got home. They searched the house and the property, but nothing turned up. So my parents got a security system a few weeks later. That was the only reason I ever felt safe inside that house ever again. I live in a pretty rural area outside of your average middle America town. It was my night off and I decided to just hang around the house myself. I got some things done around the yard, did a little self care, and then settled in with dinner and a movie for the evening. I like to be low energy every now and again, but still I have the tendencies of a night owl. The movie turned into a TV show and soon it was well past midnight. I hunkered down with my phone and a blanket and let the night really begin. Just as I'm zoning out, Someone starts pounding on my front door. Not a knock, but a full force blow against the wood. I freeze for a moment, but then I make the easy assumption it's my boyfriend coming over for a spontaneous booty call. 
This was common behavior for him and one of the reasons I did like staying up late. I barely had to stand up from the couch to be able to see through the small glass window in the front door. Now, I really do freeze. My heart is the only thing I can feel in motion, steadily slamming up my throat. Staring back at me through the pain was not my boyfriend, but an older, bearded stranger. It was the most unfamiliar face I'd ever seen. This little window in the door was weird because if you were up close and trying to look through it, the prismatic glass skewed the optics, made it impossible to know what you were looking at. You had to have some distance between yourself and the window, like I had right now, to make out what was actually on the other side. This guy was looking at me, but I knew he couldn't actually see me. I snuck back down the hallway and hid in the doorway of my bedroom. I was scared, but I would have been way more scared if I didn't have an eye on him. I couldn't imagine how I'd feel if I turned my back for one second and lost track of him. Remember when I said I live rural? Well, I also live in a cellular dead zone. I didn't even bother to find the damn thing. Instead, I stepped to my bedside and fished the landline from my end table. I hit the dial button and brung the receiver to my ear. It's completely dead in my hand. The guy hammers on the door, this time screaming at the top of his lungs. Let me in! He slurs. My blood runs cold. This is now worse than a horror movie. I start running through what few options are available to me. No phone. No way to get to the car. No one coming to get me. I have to stay inside where it's safe. That's the only thing that makes sense. First, I sneak into the kitchen. Slide the chef knife out of the block. It's the only weapon in the whole house. Next, I slink into the bathroom across from my bedroom and lock the door. It's just a weak little handle lock, but it's enough to buy me some time if he actually breaks through the front door. For some reason, the idea of keeping the high ground was pulsing through my mind. It was literally all I could think about, for I barricaded myself in the bathroom. So, I climbed up onto the countertop and crouched above the door. If he broke in, I'd be able to jump on his back and stab him in the neck and shoulders. I was terrified of the whole thing, but I do have to admit, I was very pleased with my whole little assault strategy. In my head, it made the most sense. With a knife in hand, all I had to do was sink at home. Time went by. That guy just keeps yelling. Hey, let me in. Now he was moving around the house. I could hear his hand dragging along the siding as he walked from end to end. He checked each and every window, yanking on the frame, pushing on the glass. Thankfully, I kept them all locked, as well as both doors. I could hear his frustration, and he took to wailing on the walls again, demanding I let him inside. Something occurred to me. That handset I fished out from my bedside table was dead. This psycho didn't cut the line. I just didn't charge the phone. There was a second one down the hall in the kitchen. Nervously, I climbed down from my perch on the countertop and waited until I heard the guy on the opposite side of the house. I unlocked the door and bolted for the phone, which was exactly where I thought it'd be, sitting in the cradle by the back door. I snagged it and retreated back to the bathroom. I called 911 and they dispatched a few officers but were totally transparent when they told me it'd take at least 15 minutes for them to get there. I was on my own and needed to stay frosty until they arrived. I stayed on the line until the cops arrived. They could hear the guy pulling and kicking at the doors, screaming for me to open it. The longest 15 minutes of my life. When they arrived, they apprehended the man immediately. Dispatch confirmed that I could exit the house, where I stepped out to find a whole team of cops standing around one dirty, scruffy, drunk-off-his-ass hippie-looking kid. He was cuffed, sitting on the ground, totally confused about the situation. He clearly wasn't a murderer. There was a party down the road. This kid stumbled off to take a piss or something, got lost in the dark, and thought my house was the spot. He convinced himself that everyone had locked the doors and was hiding somewhere. It turned out to be a big misunderstanding, but still, it was absolutely terrifying. To this day, nothing compares to what I felt that night. Remember to keep your phones charged and at the ready. Years ago, I moved into an older apartment. It was pretty cheap, 
and the building only had eight units in it. There were four on the ground floor and four up above it, all of them opening up to the outside. It was really all that I could afford, or else there's no way that I would have moved in there. The rent was like $400 a month, and in that location was really cheap. The apartment that I had was on the ground level and at the far end. It had one bedroom, one bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. After moving in, I didn't have a problem with filling up the space with the furniture that I had, and I didn't even have that much stuff. For the first two or three days, things went fine. I was gone for most of the day at work and back by nighttime. One night, I went to bed at about 10 o'clock, only to be woken up in the middle of the night. Somebody was knocking on my front door. I looked at the clock, and it was midnight. I sat up and turned on the light for my bedroom. Why would anybody be knocking on my door at midnight? I got up out of bed and then walked out into the living room and turned the light on. I could sort of see that there was somebody at the door, but just saw their silhouette. When the light turned on though, they turned and walked away. I didn't get a good look at them at all. I went over to the door and looked out of it, but by now they were gone and I didn't see anything. It was kind of weird, but I decided just to go back to bed. I was able to get back to sleep, and I'm not aware of the person coming back that night. I didn't wake up for the rest of the night. The next day was normal. I got up, went to work, and then came back home. That night, I fell asleep at the usual time of around 10 p.m. But once more, for the second night in a row, I was woken up in the night. This time, though, I wasn't sure what woke me. I didn't hear anybody knocking on the front door or anything. I turned over to go back to sleep, but I really wasn't that tired. I was wide awake, and I had a bad feeling for some reason. I sat up and turned on my bedroom light. Everything seemed fine to me. I decided to get up and go to the bathroom, and then try to fall back asleep. So I got up from my bed and walked over to my bedroom door. The door was closed, and I opened it to my living room and kitchen area. The living room was closest to me, and the kitchen was at the other end. The only light was coming from my bedroom, so it was kind of hard to see anything, but everything appeared to be normal. When I stepped out though, I heard a noise. It was coming from my kitchen and behind the counter in an area that was not visible to me. I stopped where I was and looked over to the counter. Now my heart started beating really fast. I had no idea what that could have been. I said, is anybody there? It was dead silent. I didn't hear any noise at all. I had no idea what to do in this situation. It sure seemed like somebody was in there, but I still was not 100% convinced. My eyes were just locked on the counter area where I had heard the noise. Then, a few seconds later, suddenly somebody appeared. They stood up from behind the counter and immediately started running towards my front door. It was probably like 15 feet away from them. It was still very dark and I couldn't see them very well, but I was sure that it was my landlord. He made it to the door, opened it up, and then ran out of my apartment. I really couldn't believe it. I ran over to the door and then locked it, then went into my bedroom and called the police. I told them that my landlord was in my apartment in the middle of the night without permission. They came out and talked to me and said that they were going to talk to the landlord next. I went back to bed and the next day got more information. The landlord admitted to being in my apartment. He also apparently was involved in other illegal activity. As a result, all of us tenants of his building had to move out and the building went to new ownership. I'm not sure of all the details. All I know is that I had to scramble to find a new place. It was for the best though because I would much rather live in an apartment without the landlord entering as he chooses. This is something that happened when I was a kid, about 13 years old. I lived with my parents and two older siblings, both sisters. I remember that my father got a new job and we had to move like an hour away. For me, it was exciting, but also kind of sad to leave our old neighborhood, especially at that age. Our new house I thought was pretty nice. It was in a neighborhood with lots of other houses we had a decent sized front and backyard. We were not rich, but it had two floors and a basement. All four of the bedrooms were upstairs, and the main floor had a kitchen, dining room, living room, and family room. There were also a couple of bathrooms and closets. We moved in one day with the help of a moving company, and then spent the next couple of days unpacking boxes and stuff. By the following week, we were all moved in, and it was summertime, so luckily I didn't have school. One night during that same week, I stayed up late playing video games. This is something that I did a lot during that time. 
Everybody else had gone up to bed, and I was by myself on the main floor and in the family room. I really don't remember exactly what time it was, but probably after midnight is what I would guess. As I was sitting on the floor and playing video games looking at the TV screen, I saw something behind it. We had a window which faced the side of our house behind this particular TV. I saw somebody walk past outside, right by the window. I couldn't tell who it was at all, but it really took me by surprise. At first, I was wondering if I really just saw what I thought I did. Our house wasn't that close to the neighbors on that side that it would be the neighbor. I had a bad feeling about it. It seemed as though whoever it was was headed into our backyard. I decided to get up and go look out of one of the back windows inside. I carefully went towards the kitchen, which was at the back end of the house. When I did, at first, I didn't see anything. I got up close to the window and looked out into the backyard. Everything seemed normal though. It was pretty dark in the backyard, but I could see most of it. I was wondering who the person was and where they had gone, but I was also glad that I didn't see them back there. After looking out the window for probably like a minute or two, I backed away. Then I headed back into the family room where I was before playing video games. Around the time that I made it back into the room though, I heard a rattling coming from the back door. Somebody was trying to open the back door leading from the backyard to the kitchen. Instantly when I heard it, I sprinted up the stairs. Then I ran all the way to my parents' bedroom. I woke them up and told them that somebody was trying to get in the house. My parents both came downstairs with me. When my dad turned on the light to the backyard, he saw the man running away. I didn't go over there, but I guess the man was by the house near the other back window and no longer at the back door. He ran out of the yard and through another neighbor's backyard before going out of sight. After the guy ran away, my parents stayed up for a bit, but the guy didn't come back. My dad went outside and saw some marks on the back door. I think the man was trying to get in. I went to bed a short time later and the guy never returned. For the rest of the time that we lived there, no more strange things like that happened either. I still wonder who the guy was and why he tried entering our house. For months, I was afraid that somebody else would try to break in. Luckily, nobody did though. When I was about 15, my family and I moved into a large house. It was a relatively new home with three bedrooms, five bathrooms, a garage, and even a large basement. Both of my parents were in the upper medical industry and worked several hours of the week. This meant that I would be home alone for the majority of the time while they were gone. I love staying alone as I like to think of myself as mature and adult-like. At the time, we lived in somewhat of a rural area of Knoxville, Tennessee. Those who have been to or live in Knoxville will probably relate to what I'm talking about. While it was a nice city, the crime rate was high and during this story, I got a taste of what that looks like. One evening, I had come home from school and my parents were at work. Unfortunately, this was around the time where COVID was still rampant, so my parents had to work extra. 15-year-old me immediately hops onto Call of Duty to cure my boredom. I play some matches for a few hours or so before going up to my room and taking a nap. I'd say I slept for a good two hours or so before I awoke to a noise from the kitchen. Looking back, it kind of sounded like a clanking noise you'd hear when moving stuff around. I wake up and take a look at my clock. It was around 7 p.m. I was genuinely annoyed from this noise and put on my slides and went downstairs to see what it was. I ever so slowly turned the corner and what I saw chilled me to the bone. There, in the kitchen, was a woman going through our fridge. She had her back toward me, so she couldn't see me or know that I was there. To provide a little more detail, she was not at all a pleasant-looking woman. She looked homeless, and looking back, I'm pretty sure she was. She wore torn shorts, a tank top, and some sort of wristband. I put my hands over my mouth and slowly went back upstairs. As much as I wanted and needed to call the police, 
I couldn't as the only home phone we had was near the kitchen. Instead, I thought of another idea. My parents were friends with the neighbors from down the road, so I would figured I'd go there and call the police. Now, I obviously couldn't have gone through the front door, so I did what anyone else would do. I opened my bedroom window and climbed out while gathering up the courage to fall. When I finally did, I hit the ground with only a sprained ankle and made my way over to the neighbors where I explained what happened. They, of course, instantly let me in to use their phone to call 911. In the meantime, they made a call to the hospital my parents worked at. The police ended up coming a lot faster than I thought and entered my house. Within a minute, they came out with an old, tired, lanky woman in handcuffs. However, she didn't try to get away or resist arrest. She seemed somewhat neutral about it, as if she had accepted her defeat. As it turns out, my theory was correct after all. She was a dangerous homeless woman who had broken into several homes in the area. My parents had come home soon after where they had spoke with the police where they then recommended we get cameras. And that's exactly what we did. The next day, my dad went out and installed a high-tech security system around the house. Surprisingly enough, the story didn't end there. It wasn't until a few nights ago where I had brought up the incident to my mom and asked if she remembered about it. Her eyes went wide with this look of fear and worry. When I asked what the matter was, she sat me down, held my hands, and said she was going to tell me something I didn't know. When her and my dad were talking to the cops that day, the cops had mentioned something that would shock them to their core. When they had entered my house, they had found the woman standing outside of my bedroom door. In her hand was one of her kitchen knives that she appeared to have been gripping tightly. Let's just say that if I hadn't jumped out of my window, things probably wouldn't have ended well for me. Thankfully, we hadn't had any break-ins as of today and I hope it stays that way. This happened back in 2014 with a few friends and I during the winter. I was 13 years old when this happened, and it's by far the creepiest and most dangerous situation I've ever been in. At the time, my family and I lived in a widely popular town of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Life was kind of like what you'd expect from Massachusetts. It snowed a lot and only got a bit warmer during the summer months. The winters here were almost brutal, to the point where you wouldn't want to go outside, even with warm clothing. One day during the peak of winter, my school had closed due to the weather, and because of that, I had invited two of my friends over, Josh and Shane. They were around my age as well, with Shane being a little older, but still in the same range. We almost never have snow days, so we knew we had to make the most of it. We started playing some video games on the Xbox, all the way to eventually playing Hide and Go Seek in the basement. My house has this really nice spacious basement that had all sorts of things, like a pool table, a living room area, and even a mini theater. My parents were asleep upstairs, and we didn't want to cause any noise, so the basement was the ideal place for us. We all decided that we'd play hide and seek to just pass the time. Seeing as to how big this basement was, we knew there would be plenty of places to hide. Josh and Shane would be doing the hiding while I would be the one seeking. Once we started, I gave them a head start of 20 seconds to go pick a good hiding spot. As soon as I yell out the all too familiar, ready or not, here I come, I instantly began looking around the basement, searching every room and even closets. However, I wasn't able to find them. For whatever reason, I turned to my left towards the dark boiler room and turned on my flashlight from my phone to light my way. 
The boiler room light was broken, which my dad had yet to fix, even though we never used the boiler room. Upon entering, I noticed a blue tarp covering something in the back of the room. The outline appeared to be a person, and that's when I knew I had finally found someone. I ever so slowly approached the tarp and remove it, expecting to see Shane or Josh hiding there. But instead, I was greeted to a dirty looking man I had never seen before holding one of my dad's power drills. It took my mind a few seconds to process as to what I was seeing before running out of the room screaming. I then look back and see the man slowly get up and begin to follow me. Thankfully, however, I had slammed and locked the boiler room door shut so he wouldn't get out. Looking back, that was probably the smartest move I've ever done in a situation like that. This caused both my friends to come out of their hiding spots and ask me what was wrong. When I told them that there was a man hiding in the boiler room, they somewhat believed me as I was already distraught. That's when we all decide to book it upstairs and wake up my parents who were still asleep. My dad was clearly in a grumpy mood, but after I explained myself, he stormed down to the basement like a madman. I guess he must have found the guy as we heard a bunch of commotion going on in the boiler room. The fight was over within a short period of time due to my dad delivering several blows to the man's face. My dad had rushed my mom to call 911 while my dad had tied him up. My dad is ex-military, so he was not the type to allow anyone to pose a potential threat to our family. It took a little while before police got to my house, but they ended up arresting him. As the police were questioning him, he admitted to simply walking into my house through an unlocked door. The reason for this was because he just needed a warm place from the freezing cold. Whether his story was valid or not, I couldn't help but feel sympathy for him. Winter is the time of year where a lot of squatters seek shelter for warmth and I'm still shocked that my house was targeted. He had also admitted that he had done this to several other homes but had got away before he was caught. My dad had called all of my friend's parents to come and pick them up as he was already uncomfortable as it is. I didn't get much sleep for a week after that and it was only after I had stayed with my grandma for a few days did I slowly begin to get over it. It wasn't until a few years after where my dad and I were watching a movie about a home invasion. I'm not sure what the movie was called, but it reminded me of the incident to which I brought it up to him. My dad sighed and said he had purposely left out an important detail that day. Apparently, as he had opened the door to the boiler room, the man had been standing there and had attempted to use the drill to harm him, and this resulted in my dad throwing punches at him. The reason he never told me this was because I was too young and that he didn't want to scare me more. It was then when I had realized that if I had opened the door again, he probably would have tried to kill me. I was a small 13 year old boy, so there was no way I could have taken him on, especially with a power drill. The last I heard, he was taken to a mental hospital after being released from prison. While this all was a terrifying situation, I just hope he's getting the help he needs. For starters, I'm a 29 year old female and currently live in upstate New Jersey with my fiance Brian. We had just bought a nice, one-storied home in the suburbs after finally moving out of my parents' house. The house wasn't anything too fancy, just your typical American-style house appropriate for a couple like us. This happened during the winter of 2021, when the pandemic was still in effect. My fiancé and I had gotten jobs as software engineers and would constantly work long hours into the day. On this particular day, I had been off from work, so I took this time to just have a nice day to myself. It was mid-December, and the news had reported heavy snowfall in the area, which made for a perfect setting. At some point during the day, 
I had decided to take our dog Crayon out for a walk along the trails by the park. We never really took him outside all that much, so I decided to give him some freedom. Crayon is a fox-faced Pomeranian, the perfect comfort dog for any household. By this point, it was snowing pretty hard, and I wanted to make the walk quick so him nor me would get too cold. New Jersey during the dead of winter was beyond freezing and you only went out when you really had to. That or you simply loved freezing your ass off. In this case, I was out for both reasons and I grew up in the cold so I was used to it to say the least. As I'm walking him by the tree line, he stops in the snow and perks his ears up facing the direction by some dense brush. In a playful tone, I ask him, Do you smell something, boy? Assuming he saw a small critter, like a lizard or something. That's when he begins to get nervous and starts barking at something in the woods. However, his barks weren't the annoying slash normal barks. These seemed more out of control, as if he had felt threatened by something. I turned to the woods, staring into the thicket, but I couldn't see or hear anything except for the sound of wind and snow falling. At this point, Crayon is going absolutely insane, running in circles, screaming, and even pissing himself. It was almost as if something had been attacking him and that he was trying to get away. This was clearly an indication that there was something or someone watching us that he could see but I couldn't. That's when I begin to feel this negative energy and I pick up Crayon and run back to the house. I thought for sure that there was definitely something back there and that whatever it was was going to follow me. I tried to run in the snow even though the blankets of the snow had slowed me down. Needless to say, we get back, and Crayon seemed to have calmed down, but was on full alert. All the while, my mind is trying to process as to what the hell just happened and why he went so berserk. I didn't bother telling my fiancé about it, or anyone else, fearing they'd think I'm crazy. But would you blame them? We've walked him out on that trail several times, and nothing close to this has ever happened. The worst thing that's happened while walking him was him nearly getting into a fight with another dog. That's it. We still take Crayon out on some walks here and there, but I always remember to use a different path. As for my fiancé, I just tell him that Crayon gets nervous around there. I still have theories as to what really happened on that day, though there isn't much evidence to back it up. My most common theory was that there was someone hiding in the woods that I couldn't see which caused my dog to freak out. The other theory was that there was some sort of entity or energy in the woods which made my dog visibly anxious. Part of me wants to believe this theory and the other part of me doesn't. Dogs can see things as humans can't, that I know for sure. It's just crazy to me that there are things in this world that we can't quite fully comprehend. Back in 2017, I worked as a delivery driver for Uber Eats to make some extra money on the side. It wasn't the best paying job, but it was something to help me get by my struggles as a growing adult. I was 25 years old, and I'm sure most of you know how life really sets in at that age. Anyway, I live in the suburbs of New York. Not the city, just the state, as I was never a city person, but lived near it. Throughout my life, I've always been more of a quiet person, which is why I really like the suburban areas. One night, I was doing some late night delivery orders to keep the income flowing when there had been an incoming weather report. The snow had been falling pretty hard and the winds were measuring well over 50 kilometers and that a blizzard was on its way. That being said, I still wanted to do a few more orders for the night. Luckily, I had received one order from someone on the other side of town. It wasn't too far, but this person barely met the delivery radius. I was annoyed because of the distance, but I realized it was another tip. 
I bit my lip and drove to the restaurant and to the given address. All the while, the falling snow began to come down fast and the winds were starting to pick up. On top of that, the snow on the sidewalks were already starting to pile up so I knew I had to get there in time. I arrive at the destination and there's this man standing outside of his terrace house wearing several layers of clothing. Just by looking at him, he did not seem like a pleasant type of man. It was one of those men that screamed stranger danger. He comes up to my car and I proceed to hand him his food when he begins to ask for some money. I ask him what it was for, to which he then says that his car had been out of gas. Okay, so I wasn't sure why that was my problem, but being nice and not wanting to piss him off, I hand him a $10 bill and wished him luck. He looked down at the money and then looked back at me with a blank expression as if he wanted more. He then said that it wasn't enough and that it could at least do 50 I told him that was all I had, but that maybe someone else could help him. The look on his face that day is something that will never leave me. It was a look of hatred and anger, as if I were his sworn enemy. I then tell him to enjoy and drove off away from the building. Doing that, however, was probably the most stupidest decision of my life. I hear two loud bangs echo through the streets along with something hitting my back tire. It didn't take me long to realize that these bangs were actually gunshots. Suddenly my car swerves from left to right and the ice didn't make it any better. Eventually I manage to get a hold of the wheel and drive back with my back tire making this awful noise. However, I was afraid of what might happen if I stopped my car in case he was following me somehow. Thankfully, I had gotten home safely just in time and didn't once look back. Police were called and I reported the incident to Uber, but nothing ever became of it. After all, this did happen in the Bronx, which isn't the safest place in the city. I guess I learned my lesson not to assume that everything I do is safe, when in reality, it isn't. About five years ago, my mom started dating a guy that she'd met on a dating site. The online dating is fine. I had recently started dating a woman who would later become my wife, and we'd met online as well. Both my girlfriend, who would later become my wife, and myself never liked this guy. We thought he was a weirdo literally from day one. We didn't think he was mean or anything like that, just creepy. He was quiet. He kept his eyes closed a lot, occasionally saying odd things, like offering my wife a chocolate, then popping one in his mouth and closing his eyes, then moaning as he let it melt in his mouth. It was all stuff that just teetered on inappropriate, but also kind of reminded me of special needs individuals I personally known as well in my life. I don't mean that in a disparaging way in the slightest just in a sense that I wondered how much control this guy had over his thoughts and his words. One time my wife and I were visiting my mom, but she got called into work, so we waited at her house. Her boyfriend was over, and he spent the entire several hours that night just hanging out in her bedroom with the door closed. We could hear noises every now and again, but for the most part, it sounded like he was just lying totally still in there. Really creeped us out because we didn't know what to do. We ended up just waiting it out, but maybe be a little bit more of a host next time. Just before Christmas, my mom and this guy start having some difficulties. My wife and I were visiting for the holidays. She dropped all of her problems on us, and we listened carefully, gave our opinions, and suggested that she might be better off without him. She had already made her mind up, though, and decided to break up with him on Christmas Eve. I couldn't help but smile. Of course, she'd been lying out this entire plan, down to the day of when to do it and then explained it to us purely for confirmation. What I was smiling about was that she'd already lured us into the house for the holiday weekend. We're going to be stuck in the crossfire after she dumps this guy. All I can imagine is him quietly collecting his belongings before murdering us in our sleep. Thanks, Mom. We spent the night at my mom's and got up early on Christmas morning to visit my dad at his house. We didn't plan to spend the night at my dad's, but we got snowed in, which was actually a nice Christmas surprise. 
We had avoided the entire breakup conversation the night before, and then got out of there pretty much the moment the sunrise, and we were happy to be now stuck at my dad's. The next day we left as soon as we could, to get through the snow. My wife suggested that we stop by my mom's house on the way, make sure that she was okay. My wife just had a really bad feeling about that ex-boyfriend. I couldn't blame her. That whole weekend was like a perfect murder setup. It was a holiday weekend, fresh blankets of snow, family members coming and going, adding to the chaos. With my mom and that guy snowed in alone, the reality became more clear that there was potentially danger at hand. My mom's car was in the driveway, but that doesn't really mean much. She lives close enough to work that she actually walks often. She never locks her door, which drives me crazy, so we let ourselves in. That's when we see blood oozing out of the refrigerator's water dispenser. It had filled up the spill container and was leaking onto the floor and made this giant puddle. My wife screamed and I freaked out. I fully expected to see my mom's head in the freezer. The house is caught in this eerie half light. No sound or movement. There doesn't seem to be anyone around. I holler both of their names into the house and get no response. A sour pit is churning in my stomach and I'm starting to really entertain the idea that the worst has happened. It's not hard to do when you're seeing exactly what you didn't want to see. I nervously open the freezer to find a bag of frozen cherries that had been opened, crammed into the freezer so that it fell onto the ice dispenser and then melted. My mom turned out to be in the shower just warming up. Ex-boyfriend was nowhere to be found. We told her about the cherry incident, to which she gave us this funny look and asked us to show her. She claimed she never even bought frozen cherries, didn't have any. Those weren't hers. We think the ex-boyfriend bought them, opened them, and then arranged them in the freezer so they'd thaw and drip, like a weird, ominous power move. For Dayton, Ohio, Christmas time of 1992 would become synonymous with a group whose name would haunt the city for many, many years to come, the Downtown Posse. Since their meeting during a night of drinking just two weeks prior, 22-year-old Marvallis Keene and his 16-year-old girlfriend Laura Taylor had been inseparable. Laura had recently been kicked out of her parents' house. She had no job and had quickly become financially dependent on Marvallis, who had burned through what little cash she had keeping her entertained. Around two weeks before Christmas, the couple spent the last of their cash on a single night stay in a downtown Dayton hotel and were desperate for money. Fortunately, Laura had an idea. She knew a man named Joseph Wilkerson who had a rather lucrative job at General Motors, a man who spent a sizable amount of his disposable income on sexual deviancy. The plan was simple. Laura would call Joseph, invite him to an orgy in exchange for a sizable amount of cash. Once they knew he had the cash on hand, they could get into his home with the help of a fellow member, Heather Matthews, and rob him. But the raid turned into something far more horrific than a simple smash and grab. On Christmas Eve, once Marvallis, Heather, and Laura had forced their way into Joseph's home at 3321 Prescott Avenue, they tied him to a bed with electrical cord, torturing him until he gave up the cash. But once the money was secured, Marvallis used a 32 caliber Derringer to execute their victim so he couldn't report them to the police. After the murder, the trio made themselves at home, raiding Joseph's fridge and playing loud music before stealing his car, which now facilitated their killing spree. What came next can only be described as a frenzy of violence. The next victim was Danita Gallette, who was shot multiple times while using a payphone at 517 Neal Avenue. There was no plan this time. It seemed like they just shot a totally random person in the middle of the street before jumping out of a stolen car and taking her shoes, jacket, and a backpack. After they were apprehended by the police, the surviving members of the downtown posse would admit that the sole motivation for Danita's cold-blooded murder was to steal her brand new sneakers. The third victim that night was a man named Jeffrey Wright, who was shot four times while standing outside of 157 Yuma Place. Thankfully, he was lucky enough to survive the attack, but as it turned out, Jeffrey had a personal connection to the group. He was the ex-boyfriend of Heather Matthews, who was, by that time, in a relationship with another downtown posse member, Demarcus Smith, and it was he who pulled the trigger four times, hitting Jeffrey in both legs. Fortunately, he was able to escape to a neighbor's house and get himself some medical assistance. The downtown posse then rested for the night, but planned on resuming their spree the very next day. 
As the sun set on Christmas Day 1992, the group had decided on their next victim, a man named Richard Maddox, and he too had a connection to the posse. He was Laura Taylor's ex-boyfriend, who was lured from his parents' house with the promise of reconciliation. He picked her up in his car, and the pair then drove around discussing their past relationship. But unbeknownst to Richard, the rest of the downtown posse followed close behind. Richard soon figured out that he was being tailed. He grew nervous and attempted to make a quick getaway. And that's when Laura put the Derringer pistol to his head and pulled the trigger, killing him instantly. Then as the car was about to crash, Laura threw herself out of the moving vehicle and was then picked up by the fellow gang members. On the following day, Sarah Abraham was working at the family-owned shortstop mini market on West 5th Street when the posse entered the store. Once again, Laura Taylor seemed to be leading the group in selecting their victims, scouting ahead and entering the store first to ensure that they would not be overwhelmed or outnumbered. She was followed by Demarcus and Marvallis, who shot Sarah in the face before wounding a customer who was just picking up groceries. Sarah would survive for five days in the hospital, but eventually, she would succumb to the complications stemming from those wounds. Immediately following that shortstop shooting, the posse made their way to Salem Avenue, where they found a woman airing up her tires at a gas station. As soon as the woman saw them approaching with guns drawn, she fled. But it wasn't this that saved her life. It later came to light that Laura Taylor had demanded that Marvallis shoot her as soon as she ran. But he hesitated, and the woman was able to make her escape. It's a highly disturbing detail that the youngest and seemingly most innocent of the four was evidently the most bloodthirsty. The posse then stole the woman's black Dodge Shadow, the same car that was pulled over in a traffic stop that led to their arrest. In the aftermath of them being apprehended, the group told the police where to find two more bodies, those of Wendy Cottrell and Marvin Washington. Their bodies were at the city-owned gravel dump, located at 1654 Richley Drive. These two were members of the posse that Laura Taylor ordered the execution of because she believed they knew too much and would break under police pressure. They told the two soon-to-be victims they all wanted a party and told them to get in the car. A short while later, Marvallis pulled the car over into the gravel pit, ordered Wendy and Marvin to get out, and then he and Demarcus shot them in cold blood. It's terrifying that the downtown posse quickly went from killing for financial gain to just killing for the thrill of it, and all during the most festive time of the year, when families the victims would have been extra devastated to learn their loved one's demise. Given that Christmas is such a family-oriented holiday, perhaps the only solace we can take in this case is to learn that Marvallis Keen was executed for his part in the murders, and the families of the victims managed to get some measure of justice. I was invited to a party on New Year's Eve, and a couple that are my friends were invited too. Since the guy knew the way to the party and I didn't and they live about 20 minutes from me driving, I gave them a ride. It was a nice party with 15 friends and we spent the night okay. But in the morning, even though that our friend had told us we could sleep at his house and drive home when we woke up, we still decided it was time to go home. This was around 5.30am. I drank only a bit of champagne so I could drive and both my friends from the couple drank almost nothing since they were spending the next day with the girl's family and didn't want to be hung over, so we were sober when this happened. We said our goodbyes and got out of the house. We know that the area is known for having pretty sketchy characters, but the car was a two-minute walk from the house and we didn't expect to get in trouble. We were wrong. So as we got out of the house, there was this one guy just standing in the middle of the parking lot smoking what smelled like weed. We walk on the opposite side of the road of this guy, but he starts messing with my girlfriend. She's really pretty, so guys usually stare and she's used to it, but this guy starts making infelicitous comments to her with her obvious boyfriend, my friend, that has his arm around her right there. We look at him, but say nothing since we are right next to the car when he starts walking towards us. So we get in and I quickly lock the doors and drive away fast before he can catch up to us. But since that town was unknown to us and big, we had to stop and turn the GPS on. After we do this we get on the road but immediately have to stop at a red light. 
A car stops right next to us, which would be normal if it wasn't like 5.45 a.m. We look at it, and that creepy guy is inside, staring at us. At this time we started commenting that he probably saw our car stopped and was waiting for us to ride away. But we didn't want to freak out, so we just kept looking forward and kept driving, thinking we were probably overreacting and that this guy could just be going the same way as us. But as the drive continues, we get on the highway. So does the guy, and he is obviously stalking us. When I speed up, he speeds up. When I slow down, he slows down. I even pretended I was going to leave the highway in one exit and quickly return to the main highway road, and he copied that exact same move. We start freaking out, but keep driving as me and the girl's boyfriend try to calm her down, saying there are two of us and only one of him, who was very lightly high. We are not that huge. I'm like 5'9", 140 pounds, and her boyfriend is like 5'10", 154 pounds, and the guy, besides being tall, was really skinny too, and we were just afraid of how crazy he was, crazy enough to stalk us. Forty minutes of stalking later, we get out of the highway so I can take them home, but I stop two streets away from my girlfriend's house and the car stops behind us, making her boyfriend jump out of the car and me following him. I wouldn't let him be alone. We don't know how crazy that guy is, and I have a really heavy bat in my car which I take with me. It's forbidden to have this kind of thing in cars in my country, but whatever, I have it anyway for protection. As we start approaching the car, he quickly speeds up, making a U-turn and driving away, back for the highway, or so we thought. My friends take their stuff and say they can make the walk home, it's about three minutes, going between the buildings and avoiding the roads. So we say our goodbyes and I get back to the car and start driving to the highway to get home. As I make the U-turn to get close to the highway, I see that creepy guy's car waiting there and he starts following me again, probably thinking my girlfriend is still there. Now I freak out a little bit more. I'm alone and even if I have the bat in the car, I don't know what this guy has in his so we get on the highway and I start driving normally, pretending I didn't see him. And the second I see two huge trucks in front of me, I speed up and pass between them. At this time, I'm driving around 87 miles per hour, looking at my rearview mirror to see if I'm losing the guy. My exit appears, and I take it. I get off the main road into a side road from where I can see the highway and stop there. I turn off the car lights and look at the highway, and see that guy's car get off of the highway, but quickly getting back on. I guess I really lost him, and he just got out and re-entered because the place where I live is the last exit where the highway is free of charge. I calm down and drive home all the way looking behind my shoulder. Nothing really happened, but my greatest fear was for my friend, and for me, after I was alone.